Good morning. I will now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is 9 a.m. June 28th, 2022. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now proceed with a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. Is there any member of the board that wishes to dedicate this moment to anyone? Seeing none, then um, we'll just have a moment of silence then. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. CAO Palacios, are there any additions to or deletions to the agenda today? Yes, there are some uh, corrections to the agenda. And, um, on the regular agenda, item number nine, there's additional materials, attachment 3B, insert after packet page 53. And then on the consent agenda, there's item 38, staff requests this item be deleted. This is packet pages 706 to 718 on item 75. Recommended action number three should read, advertise a notice of request for qualifications for a 10 day period beginning on July 2nd, 2022. And then on item 75, there's additional materials, attachment C, insert after packet page 1479. That concludes the revisions to today's agenda. Thank you. Proceed to item four. Is there any uh, board members that wish to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda? Yeah. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll proceed with public comment. Spoken. Um, sorry, one moment. Any person may now address the board during public comment period. Speaker, speakers must not exceed two minutes in length. And individuals may speak only once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, and yet to be heard on the regular agenda, or a topic not on the agenda, which is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or subsequent board of supervisors meeting. Also, just to clarify, uh, for those of you, um, the uh, item 38 was the item addressing the downtown library, and that has been deleted from today's agenda. We will not be hearing that today. Um, and we are going to try to get to the core item as quickly as possible here. Uh, it is scheduled to, uh, for the third item on our regular agenda, item nine. Uh, so I ask if you are here to speak about that, to hold common uh, until we hear the item. Thank you. Please proceed. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm glad that the core item is on there. I guess I missed that when I was reading it. I'm glad it's on there. Over 1,700 pages today. There were 13 items on the consent agenda that I noted to look at further. Um, 1,700 pages is quite a bit. Uh, the number 66, which has to do, I believe, well, I'm gonna look into it, but I was just really questioning that. So, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage means you move forward in the face of fear. I was here last week and I listened to a lot of commentary. It was great. I learned a great deal. I wish that I had shared some other information, but I was here. Um, So there's just a lot of things that aren't being discussed and maybe now's not the time. Um, I was graced last week to get on speakerphone with a friend and asked to uh, talk on a syndicated radio station in LA. These three people have been doing this for 30 years. 
my friend spoke for like the first 10 and I just kind of asked them what was on their mind and stuff. I was able to be recorded for 95, 92% of the conversation for an hour and 15 minutes. I am sure looking forward to listening to that because I was probably able to cite at least 35 different people where I got my information from. <laughs> so nice to see you guys. Good conversation with you, Mr. McPherson, today. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. I just want to ask a question before I step up. Am I allowed to speak to items that are not on the agenda today? Yeah. Uh, you are. Um, we, you know, we are do have a very packed agenda, so we do ask that you keep it brief. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elise Casby. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Uh, I wanted to speak today on the library issue, the um, what was known as Measure S in the city of Santa Cruz um, to fund the libraries. And so I just want to say that I've been watching city council in Santa Cruz up until about two years ago, very, very closely. I went to probably over 70% of the meetings, maybe at least over 60. And I watched our uh, city government proceedings very closely. So I want to say something and I'm going to try not to sound holier than thou, which is my new program to be a kind of activist whistleblower who isn't so maybe righteous. But I do need to say the dealings at Santa Cruz City Council have been downright dirty. I haven't seen such dirty politics since I was growing up in the Philadelphia area. And Frank Rizzo was mayor of the city of Philadelphia. I saw flyers up on campus at UCSC that I have in my possession accusing Chris Crone and Drew Glover of being sexual molesters and harassers. Uh, and I believe those flyers said that they had been convicted of this. I saw the Sentinel lie, and I have seen really shady dealings around this entire library issue. So I am going to ask that the movers and shakers in the county and the city drop the issue of trying to force the library garage to which they added housing to sweeten the deal since it was extremely unpopular. Mr. Coonerty needs to stop his dirty politics, uh, telling things that are false to the Democratic clubs up on campus. And we need a new era of less corruption and honesty in government in Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elise. Hello, my name is Helga Niebel, and I live in Felton, California. I've been helping the homeless people for over 30 years and I know them all and I don't know what to tell you. I just know if they don't, if they, you take the showers away from them, that you're taking away part of their human dignity. They are looking forward. It's like a treat. They live in the forest, they live under the bridge with like animals. They're looking forward to cleaning to get a warm shower at least twice, three times a week. I don't know exactly. I think usually three times a week. And so I, I beg you to consider that as a human dignity aspect because they already have so much, such a hard time. They have no warm food. They live on food stamps. They live in the forest. And all they have, you know, uh, this. As the last thing, you know, I talked to some homeless person last night and he asked me to come here and speak for them. They are looking so much forward to clean themselves off living in the dirt. Please consider that as a human dignity issue and not nothing else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helga. Yeah, thank you. Um, Supervisors McPherson, Friend, Koenig, Coonerty, and Caput. Um, my name is Sarah Leonard. I'm from MHCAN, and I'm asking again that you fund MHCAN through CORE. My understanding is that you made some changes, but MHCAN is not included in those changes. Um, as um, throughout our whole lives, often people such as I, I am diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, PTSD, 
and a few more things. Um, um, oftentimes, our whole lives, we are um, overlooked. And I ask you not to overlook us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is TJ, and I just want to ask if y'all could please fund MHK. Thank you, TJ. Hi, my name is Serenity, and I'm here um, on behalf of MH Can today. I've been going to MH Can for eight years. Um, MH Can is a lifeline for a lot of people in this community. It is the oldest run peer support uh, in California, maybe in the nation. It's grassroots. We don't have funding like the managed mental health systems like Encompass and the other things that were funded through CORE. And we've been funded, and now you're taking that funding away. And it's literally a dignity issue for the people in the community who have mental health challenges. And a lot of them are homeless. And you're kicking them out of the bench lands. You're kicking them out of Oceana. You're kicking them out of the armory. And they come to MH Can for, for coffee, for showers, to do groups, to, to fuel their mental wellness. And that's what MH Can is. It's not a clubhouse where people are homeless and mentally ill and we all just hang out and smoke cigarettes all day. There's a real purpose for MH Can. It's a blessing for this community. And if you take that away and you give it to the managed healthcare systems, which you've already done behind closed doors, there'll be nothing left. Santa Cruz is a very special place. Please remember us because we do matter. And a mental health is a hot button right now in this country because of COVID. Please take it seriously. God bless you all. Thank you, Serenity. Hello, my name is Shelly Seawald and I am a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, in my lifetime, I have experienced homelessness. And um, with while I was homeless, I uh, walked into MH Can and I was able to get support. And during that time, I got encouragement to get a job, which I did. And during that time when I started that job, I still continued to use MH Can services for showers, to do my work clothes, laundry, to eat, and rides and I now have stable housing. I also am now, I've been in this restaurant for a year and a half and I am manager. And all of this has been possible with the help of MHCAN. So I am an example of what is possible with the services provided by MHCAN. It's possible to get off the streets and it's possible to have a life of stability financially and housed again. And I would just like to please beg that you do not because there's many of more of me out there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Shelly. Hello, my name is Joanna, and I'm here to represent MH Chem. I would like for you to continue to support us because I'm also one of the people that have um, benefited from all their services. So we ask that you do not overlook us, and please consider that when you are making your decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm here to speak for MH Can. Do I start? Go ahead. Okay. So MH Can personally is a miracle working place. And if there was more of them, you know, it could do wonders. I was at the bottoms of the depths of homelessness and just on the death's door. And by the grace of God, and MH Can is part of my story. Um, it restored my life. You know, it's it's a good investment for the community, not just for the homeless or for the uh, people with mental health, because we all have mental health. Like at the end of the day, it's just some people have symptoms and problems, but for the entire Santa Cruz and the entire like community, it would be a great investment for everybody's mental health. You know, it, it serves everybody and um, it saves lives and it creates community and it gives people a place to be. Because I don't know if you've ever experienced not having a place to be and not feeling safe and feeling all these things and emotions. But if you ever felt that, you would know, like you, you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy, you know? So if you could fund it, I'd be appreciated, you know, doing God's work. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. My name is uh, Richard Lewis. I just couldn't understand. Is this just on like showers and mental health or anything that isn't on the agenda? You, you can speak to any item on the agenda or. Well, and I'm happy to be here. There's legislation and I'd like to make it known it's called California Youth Empowerment, but Commission. 
And instead of being focused on high school, it's focused to the age 25. I've asked in the past to create a hub for youth and youth development. If you've done that, I, I would sure like to research and learn what that hub for our county is. And if it's not there, I would ask you to do research with staff of what would youth empowerment look like in the cities. Know that at high school in Santa Cruz and Watsonville, at the time our CEO here, they had a youth city council. Now that's different if we raise it to 25 and have a youth mayor and a youth city council in places like Scotts Valley or Aptos or anywhere. So I see I've got 39 seconds, but hope that you'll do your research and then bring up what you find with the hub being Cabrillo, because we're in the shadow of UC Santa Cruz. And to those who don't know me, I'm full time and I'll be 85 years young. My prayer to live one more day. And I'll put these upstairs because the homies are coming as a club as we move forward, like in uh, across the hill, the Latinos for a new America. I ask you to help move forward youth empowerment in this county. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Good morning. My name is Joanna Devers. I'm the Director of Institutional Engagement at the Peninsula Open Space Trust, also known as POST. Uh, over a decade ago, POST joined forces with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, Semper Virons Fund, and Save the Redwoods League to, to protect a property we now call the San Vicente Redwoods property. It's over 8,500 acres in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I'm just here today to express uh, gratitude to the Board of Supervisors and to county staff for your support in helping direct some really important state funding to this project. It's item 54 on your consent agenda today. Um, Supervisor, I'm sorry, Assembly Member Mark Stone championed this project at the state level because it provides some really important um, public benefits to the Santa Cruz Mountains region. We're going to be able to provide year round emergency access for vehicles into remote parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we're going to do some important shaded fuel break work with this funding. The County of Santa Cruz played a really important role in helping direct this funding to our organization. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Devers. Hello, my name is Hernan Torres, and I just want you guys to help fund uh, MH Can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I want to um, highlight your correspondence. Here it is AA on your printed. On the online agenda, it was AF. This is a letter from Matthew Kaufman conveying to you his concerns that he was dismissed as a county fire volunteer simply because he um, questioned some of the tactics that Cal Fire and County Fire did during the CZU Lightning Complex fire. There has never been an after action analysis on this fire by Cal Fire and they have refused to do so. I have asked your board a number of times to do an operational after action review and interview investigation with your County Fire volunteers and it has not happened. This is very disturbing to me. Cal Fire is essentially reducing our volunteer force at a time when we need more. This is unacceptable and I ask you to look into it. I want to highlight also that there will be this $3 million 400 feet shaded fuel break on Warren Alla Road and Dewey Road improvements. That is excellent. I want to see what the road improvements will look like. And I urge your board to also impress upon state parks the importance of reopening the emergency evacuation for the last chance community. A man died. A man died because he was trying to use that evacuation route. But state parks cut off. This is unacceptable. Please work with state parks and get that open again. 
Finally, I want to bring to your attention items 23 and 24 on the consent agenda, moving the county emergency communications radio system, completely changing coverage within our South County area, moving the equipment from the fire station two in Watsonville up to Mount Madonna. This will have big changes for our communication. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. And I'm concerned. Thank you. I don't know, does that work? Okay. Um, my name is Blair. I I go to MH Can, and I'm very glad that you are funding some other organizations that offer services to the community as well. However, I did notice that MH Can was not being funded, and I am a little bit concerned about that. Frankly, I am. I think that um, cutting that funding will still devastate a lot of the community. I think it's good that you guys are funding other places, but I would really like it if you considered funding us as well, as would many members of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Schwilk. I work at Community Bridges Mountain Community Resources. I work directly with our unhoused folks who will be severely impacted by the proposed cuts to core funding. They come in for a hot shower and laundry service. They tell me daily how grateful they are for this. We are the only center in San Lorenzo Valley that offers these types of services and now they will end because of the proposed cuts to funding. Where do I tell them to go now? This is only one of the many services we offer to our community that are at risk. And I ask you to please reconsider and fund Community Bridges Resource Centers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schwalk. Good morning, uh, my name is Sean Grodeau. I go to MH Can uh, frequently uh, has bathing, things like that for hygiene. I do feel that it has been a serious influence on the community, something that gives hope positive instead of just referral of what they would be. Maybe somebody would go off the deep end that there's nobody there or anything and offers like music, uh, definitely counseling, AA meetings, stuff like that. And I feel that it would really be something missing in everything if it didn't have something of involvement that was it could be you know gives hope it's positive influence and myself personally it's been something that carries me over that personal crisis of status many times and i turn to somebody and it's just you know just a smile or something has usually been that gives hope you know but there's always more to life than what people can provide that they care about can't really care for and I always feel that maybe some kind of influence, maybe bulletin or something, even more involvement wouldn't be a bad thing. And funding, it, it really would be, it would need something that it would guide it in a direction. And I just, well, I don't know. I feel like I'd, I'd lose something seriously wherever I go. I don't have family. There's a lot of people out there like that, that they've just been, and it's not like they just fell out of the sky. You know, it's a lot of personal stories. Not too many people could say, and I just, you know, it really is something. So whatever the decisions would be about financing, and it should be known that it has been seriously something that's been a positive influence carried away from many crisis of suicide and other just pointless, endless acts of what it could be. And, uh, you know, I'd like to thank council for considering an approach. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Hi, my name is Lily. Um, I spoke to you guys last week. Um, MH Can picks up where uh, society leaves off. So we have people who are trying to find a job, but they can't get a shower. And if they can't get a shower, they can't get a job. If they can't wash their clothes, they can't show up to that job. If they're not mentally stable, then they can't show up to that job day in and day out. And that, that was my story. Um, I had to left the workforce because of my mental health. And, um, you know, things go really bad after that. Um, we... <laughs> 
provide the facilities and the infrastructure to let people reintegrate and rejoin society after they've had a crisis that may have removed them from it. Um, I get emails about people who are struggling with hoarding or anxiety, and they're just asking for help. And they're asking for us to help them and asking for a place that they can go to talk about their anxiety and get tools in a community that's not gonna judge them, is gonna accept them exactly where they are and meet them where they're at. Um, we have been the liaisons between other nonprofits in town, helping people get housing um, and really doing really vital work. And I really hope that the funding is um, restored. Um, someone said a while ago that, you know, you might not notice us while we're here, but you'll definitely notice us when we're gone. So thanks you guys. Thank you, Lily. I won't be able to stay when the item comes up and for core funding. So my comment will be on the core funding. I'm Maida Melendrez, Program Director for the Family Resource Collective of Community Bridges. While I appreciate the efforts to recommend bridge funding, it's simply not enough. It would be ideal for county staff making recommendations to meet with us and hear impacts to make better informed decisions. We are here to voice to our concerns. We want to continue partnerships and find ways that will better serve the community. Thank you to those that made the time to listen to us and to those that ignored our request to meet. I hope you're able to find the time. I still have lingering questions, but the most pressing one is, where will we send our participants that no longer will have access to programs being defunded? Specifically, where will our houseless participants from the SLV area go for services when the transportation costs are at their highest? And for them to go to Santa Cruz regularly, it's not feasible. We are the only agency that maintained its doors open during the pandemic, providing direct essential services. All the other agencies closed their doors, including county agencies. We are past that now, however, it really demonstrates who was at the forefront during the most time in need. We are committed to serving our community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing so no one else here in the chambers will uh, go to Zoom. So anyone on Zoom knows just to address us for public comment. Caller ending in 1401, your microphone is now available. Uh, this is Marilyn Garris. Thank you to the previous speakers. And I know that there's plenty of financial allocation for harming the community. And I speak of the telecom industry, uh, despite their assurances, no safe amount of exposure to radio frequency microwave radiation exists. As Dr. Sharon Goldberg has stated, wireless radiation has biological effects, period. Three major epidemics are related, mental health issues, diabetes, heart problems, to name a few. Currently, Santa Cruz County is guaranteeing even more biological radiation damage than now exists from hundreds of radiation emitting Verizon 4G sites. Why do I say this? At the February 24th, 21 meeting, Zoom meeting of the Planning Commission, county code amendments were proposed and since adopted by you with a stated overall goal, and I quote, for a rapid build out of wireless infrastructure and to upgrade existing facilities for 5G networks, particularly in rural areas. Significantly omitted from that document was the fact that no resident and or child has authorized 24-7 voluntary mandatory bodily microwave harmful radiation trespass. We do not Thank you, consent. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Debbie Hinkey, your microphone is now available. 
Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County for 47 years. Now as a CSA 48 um, taxpayer, being taxed twice, I'm flabbergasted that the Board of Supervisors do not hold the largest entity of our money accountable. Cal Fire is allowed to dismiss volunteers when they should be training them. See letter AA. Cal Fire has not been held accountable for the failures of the CZU fire by not having to deliver an after action review. You need to require this for future safety of our volunteers and firefighters. Cal Fire is allowed to do what they want when they want, but at our expense. There does not seem to be any accountability of the CSA 48 taxes, and I do not support the automatic cost of living increase in collecting these taxes since you have failed to show that they are necessary and appropriate. I do not even know if they have been allowed to hire or if they have gone and hired the third person that they were supposed to on the basis of the CSA second assessment. Also, I ask that you move the 31 um, agenda to public hearing. This resolution has no basis to support for you to support the downtown library when there is so much opposition to this project by the people of Santa Cruz. It's a waste of money. If you want affordable housing, build it yourselves instead of approving high-end giveaway projects like the Aptos Village. Do not show support for a retiring supervisor who has no future investment in the people of Santa Cruz by trying to complete a monstrosity of a parking garage, library, and housing, changing the culture of Santa Cruz. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hinkey. Serge, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the co-chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board. These comments are mine personally. They do not represent the Mental Health Advisory Board. I'm speaking in support of consent item number 59. As you know, filling open positions is a challenge across the county. Specifically, the Health Service Agency and Behavioral Health Department have been struggling to fill grant-funded positions due to their being limited-term positions. Please support number 59 to turn these needed positions into permanent positions within the H HSA budget as recommended by staff and to make them more, um, more likely to get applicants, needed applicants. Thank you. Separately, please support consent item, agenda item number 48, to be in compliance with AB 1869 for agency pay for inmate electronic monitoring equipment due to the disproportionate low income population, which has previously been challenged with these costs. This program allows for lessening of the strain on our daily, daily numbers for those appropriate for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. Harry, your microphone is now available. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm Carrie Thompson. I'm with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz. I would like to uh, express thank you to you for considering the funding for the Warrenella Road Shaded Fuel Break. This is a very important piece of fire protection in our community and will protect the communities of San Lorenzo Valley and Bonnie Dune from the heavily forested areas on the western part of the of the Warnella Road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Clay, your microphone is now available. <clears throat> Thanks, Board. Clay Kemp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council. And I want to thank uh, and encourage the Board to uh, take the recommendation under item 65, community program funding. Uh, it's partially gets us to where we need to go in terms of uh, correcting some of the flaws we have in the allocations being made. I, I think one of the overarching issues, however, is that it's nice that there was an 11% increase to the total pool, but since we last went out for bid for these services, there's actually been 18% increases in cost of doing business. So we're losing ground and that's just going to automatically create some challenges. Uh, a couple other things that I wanna bring up is I, I would encourage the board in future discussions to return to having a designated staff person evaluate and monitor all the programs that are funded and come back annually with a report to the board about how well or poorly 
those programs are doing. I think that's probably the best approach to making sure your dollars are well spent and also in telling the uh, positive story that most of these programs will provide. Um, lastly, I want to bring up just the issue of how this funding is being distributed, not so much the process, but just by the question of what we're trying to do here. Historically, county and city funds have been used as supporting an existing safety net. And the current direction seems to be going towards making more of a foundational approach where we evaluate any given grant without looking at the bigger picture of what our long-term goals and achievements are. So I think that's a lengthy discussion that needs to take place. Hopefully it will occur because I think that drives what process we end up with and what kind of decisions we ultimately make. And I think all of us have the same goal. We're trying to create a better community. So I encourage you to uh, take all those actions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kempf. Coral, your microphone is now available. Coral, your microphone is now available. Hi, sorry, I don't, I didn't mean to, uh, I, I'm sorry, I think I must have hit something. I didn't mean to speak. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Melissa, your microphone is now available. Melissa, go ahead and accept the unmute. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa. I am a resident of Santa Cruz County, and I'm here today to ask the board to reconsider the allocation for the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz and increase that funding, um, specifically the funding to mental health support services that would support LGBTQ plus youth. Um, I think as a queer person myself, um, supporting queer youth is incredibly important and vital to our Santa Cruz community. And I just asked the board to reconsider that funding. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. How many uh, more folks do we have on Zoom at the moment? At this time, we have two speakers. Okay, we'll take them. Karen, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, this is, I'm Karen Delaney, and I'm calling because um, I can't stay for the court is, issue either. But I did want to say um, that upon reflection, I would like us to focus a little bit on the larger perspective. This community used to, for two decades, invest about 1% of its general fund in sustaining the safety net through different iterations of community grant program. If this community were valuing this function, the safety net, the same as it had for two decades, you would be investing a little bit over $6 million in core, not fighting over what, uh, not fighting over process, not fighting over uh, intentions, but really looking at why is it? And this is the question I'd like us to engage in because I don't recall a debate about this. Why is it that this function, investing in the people who need services the most, has been basically cut in half as a percentage of the general fund in the last 10 years. If that's not a decision that you knew you were making, that's great. You can change it today by reinvesting. If that is, then that's a decision we all have to have. Why do you value this less than your predecessors? And what can we do to convince you that this is a smart investment? I'm grateful for the work, but I feel like we need to ask and answer the right questions. Thank you, Ms. Delaney.
Raymond, your microphone is now available. Uh, thank you, Board Supervisors. This is Ray Cancino from Community Bridges. I, again, um, unfortunately, I'm unable to stay and unable to join you today because of the lack of childcare. Um, as you know, uh, we've been advocating and speaking to you all about the impacts that CORE will have on our community. I think it's uh, incredibly uh, a difficult time, and I understand that, um, for many people in our community and to hear that a lot of their services and programs across the community, not just community bridges, but programs like Ombudsman and CASA, um, have all been uh, selected to be, to, to be defunded. I understand that there is a critical need to um, maintain um, a process, which, which is core, and we're not here to debate or argue about uh, points and percentages and differences uh, in that process. I think the process is what it is, but I do think that it's important for you to debate and understand the human impacts of the individuals that cuts uh, will occur and will happen. As you've heard of today and many other people, uh, we have serious programs that are going to be uh, defunded and, 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 sh and shut down or reduced in service. I think that um, by the result of that, uh, you know, our community is less uh, thriving and less safe uh, and less open to supporting its residents. I commend the board for finding a half a million dollars to help support uh, programs that are not funded for the next three months. Uh, but that's going to do little to really impact the long-term investments and the long-term impacts of those program closures. Um, I know that um, there's very uh, a varied amount of information that is lacking in terms of making that decision. And every time you do not have that uh, question in those conversations, it's a zero-sum game, and you're really just playing with every three years and not knowing what services you're going to be able to provide to your community. I think with the large uh, reserve that you are building, um, the rainy day reserve, it's the wrong time to be looking at that when you have so many people still suffering from COVID. And I ask you to urge uh, for further investment. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cantino. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, then we'll bring public comment to a close and I'll bring it back to the board for comment uh, or action on the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, if, I, if it's okay, I'll-, yeah, I'll Supervisor Fenn, please. Thank you. I recognize we have a lot of items, and so I'm just gonna speak to one item, but I, I do have questions of staff regarding item 73. Is somebody present? This is on the vacation rental item. Uh, Ms. Hansen is approaching the podium. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Koenig, Supervisors, Stephanie Hansen, Assistant Director with the new Community Development and Infrastructure Department. Happy to answer any questions that come up on this item. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate this item. Um, this item actually raised a lot of red flags for me and produced a lot of concerning data. The board, as you know, had spent a significant amount of time uh, working with your department, updating the ordinance in order to make uh, the provisions around renewal or revocation or even initial application uh, much more stringent as well as the enforcement side of it. So I had some questions of it because this, this report showcases that there are, uh, well, depending upon how you count it, somewhere over 100, potentially multiple hundreds of unpermitted units. And so my first question is just uh, what we're doing in regards to enforcement regarding these unpermitted units. There was nothing that was uh, specified as to what's being done in regards to that. Uh, right, the report um, uh, does state that we will send out, begin the enforcement process by sending out letters to the um, properties that are shown not to have permits. So that would begin the co-compliance process for those properties. And how long does that process take? I, I ask because I just want to ensure that there, that we as a county are actually providing an incentive for people to get permits. So, I mean, it seems like right now there really isn't an incentive with there's that many people that are unpermitted that are that are advertising. So what are what kind of enforcement timeline are we talking about? Um, you know, code compliance is a process, right? So they'll begin with a letter um, that uh, states what the uh, problem is and the violation they need and how they need to fix it. Typically, um, we're trying to get folks to come in for a permit so that we can legalize their 
uh, situation. They're given a certain amount of time to respond. Um, and when we um, have communication with them, we will um, do a round of uh, education, as it were, to try to help them understand what the process is and the permitting um, that's necessary, what the rules are for operating a vacation rental. Um, for those that are not responsive, we would we would begin um, uh, on, with notices of violations and citations for those properties. Okay, I, I mean, maybe maybe other board members would have a different opinion on this, but when we updated the ordinance, as, as I'm sure you are even more familiar than I am under 694 subsection L, we specifically called out the fact that if people were operating unpermitted, if they had any violation, uh, that a violation of the requirements to obtain a vacation rental permit may be grounds for denial of a new vacation rental permit application. I mean, I, I didn't think we were necessarily in, in the process of rewarding people of coming into compliance. Again, for me, that's an incentive to, to operate outside of the system because you get to operate outside of the system for an extended period of time. And then the county tries to welcome you into a process that we created a process in order to make it harder for people that are operating outside of the system. This is the bad actor theory that we had presented previously during these discussions of how do we get people, how do we revoke bad actors? How do we deny new applications? And, and it doesn't sound like that that is necessarily the process. And so I want to express a concern over, over that because I think that, that we aren't doing enough on the compliance side. So I'll just flag that. I think that this is going to be a comeback kind of item, um, but I, I wanted to, to flag that concern. Also, in regards to the number of complaints that you had received, um, what is the, 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 the number was pretty low considering the number of emails that I imagine uh, Supervisor Koenig and I received about this of people complaining about permitted vacation rentals or maybe unpermitted. So how do you interface with the sheriff's office then for people that are operating outside of contacting you? Um, typically, uh, co-compliance will um, reach out to the property owners and before new uh, permits or renewals are issued, we'll double check the sheriff's records um, to make sure those violations um, are not raising any red flags and look further into them if they are. Um, the sheriff's office uh, has, you know, citations that are kind of property specific. So they don't really characterize things as far as I know as vacation rentals or not vacation rentals, but we can work with them further to see if there's a way to indicate um, that particular land use so that we know better what's happening out there. And we can also reach out to the sheriff's office as we begin this process of, of co-compliance in this round. So I guess what I'm hearing then, there isn't an address by address sort of list of when, if somebody were to call the sheriff's office, that information isn't isn't shared over to you, it sounds like, and, and neither is it specifically sought. It's, I think from a structural standpoint, because uh, in the middle of the night, if somebody's having a noise disturbance, they're going to call the SO, right? And I think that we need to then have a way that that information, either through a coding or by, by a, a permitted or unpermitted address known list, is shared with code compliance. Right now, it doesn't sound like that's the case. Is that true? Yeah, typically, it's more of a active look on our part to see what the citations are that are gathered on any particular property in the sheriff's office. But um, we can uh, work further with them to see if there's a more proactive way to get those complaints to us besides us looking up there um, on their system, what uh, parcel by parcel. Okay. All right. Then I think that'll be part of, I guess, maybe some additional direction that we can, we can work to create. What I think we need to do is I think that as part of this report, Ms. Hanson, I think we need to have an annual compliance report that's built into this that actually shows this information, the number of complaints that went to the sheriff's office, the length of time that it took for compliance uh, back from code enforcement, the number of revocations, the number of revocation hearings, the number of people that were denied new applications as a result of that. And all that is uh, was really the intent of the modifications of, of the ordinance that we did that are, that's lacking in this. Th this just shows me that there's a lot of unpermitted people and, and it doesn't show that there's necessarily... Uh, an outcome. So to that also, I think then, then the complaint process itself, I think that we need to look into ways to improve that for the end user on our website or wherever it may be. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts or suggestions on ways that we can improve that, but 
we need to make it easy. We need to make it trackable and we need an internal communication system between your office, the auditor controller and the sheriff's office to make this a, a unified sort of presence to make this um, make compliance improve moving forward. Do you have any thoughts on, on ways to improve the complaint process for, for the community? The um, co-compliance maintains a portal online in which anybody who has a complaint can um, register their um, their issue. Um, I think what would we really need to do is sit down with the other two departments and figure out how we can uh, communicate better on what they're seeing versus what we're seeing. So getting the uh, data with uh, from Granicus was kind of uh, step one um, in this process. Um, I will say that code compliance continues to be complaint based. Um, there is, as you know, because you just funded or are helping us to fund a new uh, unfunded position, which we really appreciate. Um, there's a, a, a backlog. Each co-compliance case can, can get complicated if it involves unpermitted structures or um, otherwise unallowed uh, land uses. Um, and it's a you know it's a long it's a long process, and some of them will go all the way to court, um, so that can take up a tremendous amount of of staff time. So it's a matter of you know how we continue to use our resources and balance our our resources. Um, there are other communities that have act, very active programs, and we understand that, but they're also staffed for that particular uh, co compliance problem. Okay, I understand. I mean, we just we did approve the voters, I should say, just approved a new TOT that included an increase specific on these vacation rentals. I think that as part of the mid-year budget conversation, that should be included as far as how compliance. There's an expect it written right into the ballot language was mentioning an improvement in compliance. And so I think that we we may need to look into that. Then I guess I'll just close on what I assume I know the answer. So I assume there haven't been any revocations then since the new ordinance. There haven't been any hearings, there hasn't been any. Uh, denials of new applications. Is that correct? Uh, there have not been any revocations, and I don't, I, I can't speak to the denials. I'm not sure about that, but I don't believe so. Okay. I complete. I, so great, uh, significant gratitude for you and your team being able to answer these questions and coming forward today. I would like to, when it comes time, Mr. Chair, to make a motion to add additional direction on this item because I think that we do need uh, to establish a process moving forward for the board's previous intent. Thank you, Ms. Hanson. Thank you. And no other uh, comments on any other item here, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, so uh, first let me just say, I agree with Supervisor Friend's concerns around item number 73, and we need uh, just more oversight and uh, an action to bring these folks into compliance and to collect the TOT and to do the various things that we promised uh, neighborhoods uh, and the community going forward. So I'll support whatever action he outlines. Um, just a couple comments and one additional direction. So uh, first, as was mentioned, I appreciate on number 54, this Warrenella fire break. Uh, as we come upon the two year anniversary of the CZU fire, I think it's um, incredibly important, obviously, that we take uh, engage in efforts to reduce uh, the risk of fire through suppression. And this is an important effort. And I wanna thank the land trust and post and all the partners we have uh, who are uh, engaging in this project. Uh, on um, item number 68, which is the veterans home key um, funding. Um, I really appreciate this effort to house uh, veterans who are experiencing homelessness in our community. And I look forward to further state investment in order to serve uh, other populations. This is a small project, but I think it's um, a great example of how we can um, build tangible project projects that get uh, shelter over people's heads and create a sense of community to help people um, recover and reestablish their lives. Um, on item number 73, uh, Supervisor McPherson and I would um, like to uh, recommend that we uh, continue this item to uh, the second meeting in August. Um, unfortunately, this, this report was not responsive to previous board direction. Um, in the meantime, uh, he and I will meet with the a HSA director to go over specific concerns. Um, when the when the item returns in August, we'd like HSA to identify uh, eight additional disposal kiosks 
to be installed and managed by the county. Um, and also uh, that uh, the August report should contain per previous board direction, um, the number of needles collected by the down in the kiosk, downtown street stream, save our shores, the city of Santa Cruz parks and recreation, all of them keep this data. And we've asked that they be in these reports going forward. And so we'd like to see it uh, in the report when it comes back in August. And that's all my comments for today. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. And just to clarify, I think you said that that was additional sort of direction you're suggesting for item 58. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, on item number 68, uh, Project Home Team, uh, Vets Village and Ben Loman, I want to congratulate the Veterans Village uh, project team, including our county staff and community members, in getting this project off the ground. Uh, Chair Koenig and I attended an event at the Veterans Village and Ben Loman on uh, June 17th with the Loretus, uh, Loretus uh, Castro Ramirez, uh, Governor Newsom's Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and housing to announce the various uh, project home key projects in our county. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of these happen uh, as they develop, and I'm grateful that we have these projects in the works and that uh, it'll help us uh, address our affordable housing goals that we have in Santa Cruz County. On item number 91, uh, the Felton Library and the PSPS events, um, and we've had some real serious outages up in San Lorenzo Valley uh, recently, and I hope that uh, pg and &E, I've gotten just many, many emails. I want people to know that, uh, but um, I hope that they can get to this as quickly as possible. I know that they're trying to do so. We sure surely have given them that direction. Um, but I was very pleased to introduce library director, uh, our new library director, Yolan uh, Wilburn, to our OR3 staff to discuss the use of the Felton Library during a PSPS uh, event and kudos and thanks uh, to the OR3 and library executive team for su uh, successfully negotiating an agreement uh, with PG&E. We know that uh, events are triggered by a combination of high heat and uh, winds and systemic um, drought conditions that we're experiencing. And in the San Lorenzo Valley, we have many isolated seniors and others who are at high risk under those conditions. And it's really critical that uh, we have access to water and safe, a uh, cool facility during a PSPS event. And uh, they can use the internet and charge their devices. So I, I thank uh, them for uh, making this happen. And uh, in San Lorenzo Valley at the Felton Library, and I look forward to an expansion of this in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Okay, uh, the con uh, consent agenda, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, just a uh, comment on uh, number 69. Uh, it's good to see uh, Human Services Department. Uh, turn on your mic. Uh, Supervisor Cabot, is your microphone on? What, what's that? We just double check your microphone is on. Or your, your microphone. Yeah, I'm not, maybe I'm not speaking into it. It's okay. That's fine, Frank. Anyway, the Human Services Department uh, uh, working with the Veterans Vill Village Project Home Key application. Uh, it'll be um, a purchase and an upgrade of a 20 rental unit permanent supportive uh, housing project for veterans at risk of. Uh, homelessness, and uh, it's it's in Ben Lomond, uh, not too far from the Ben Lomond Market on Highway Nine. So I think it's a wonderful project, and uh, looking forward to seeing that fixed up and opened up for veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. <laughs> I just had a few comments on item 35. I want to thank Paula Woods for volunteering for the County Arts Commission. Uh, all, all our commissioners really provide um, a significant amount of expertise and uh, time to provide recommendations on uh, many county functions and uh, we, we couldn't do the work we do without them. Uh, I do think we need to refocus uh, on the resources we provide commissioners so that they're well prepared as they uh, provide that, that, that review and those recommendations. Um, and uh, I, I know it's, it's always a challenge in keeping them engaged. 
So on item 39, directing the chair to write a letter to the city of Santa Cruz in response to Mayor Bruner's letter regarding the need for additional transitional and bridge housing. I have drafted a response that makes uh, offers to make county property available to the city for transitional housing if we're able to agree on some uh, terms about management. And it's important that the city and, and county continue to collaborate in addressing our homelessness crisis. And I hope my colleagues agree that we should uh, ultimately make more resources available to our joint efforts. On item 68, I just also uh, want to add my uh, congratulations for the Veterans Village Home Key Project. I know staff worked incredibly diligently on that project to help get it across the finish line and uh, it's the Veterans Village Project team as well. A lot of hard work and it's great to see this coming to fruition. I, I know that it's not over by any means. There's a lot of uh, hard work yet to be done. Um, and so I hope, I know they have volunteer days uh, on uh, I believe it's the first Saturdays of the month and I encourage everyone to get involved. Uh, on item 73, with the report on short-term rental uh, permit code compliance. Uh, uh, thank you, Supervisor Friend, for your comments and look forward to your additional direction there. It is something that uh, my office hears about consistently, especially in the summer months. And I think, uh, as was mentioned, the fact that we're, um, you know, our county does collect a significant amount of transit, tr transient occupancy tax um, to support general services. It's, uh, it's important that we do our part as well and ensure that those vacation rentals are good community members. And that's all my comments. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will move uh, the consent agenda with the additional direction that Supervisor Coonerty provided on item, I just blanked on the item, I apologize, 58, is that correct? 58. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. And then for the additional direction, on uh, the short-term rental item, which is item uh, 73. I think that we just need to make the report that we received, I think we need to make an annual report on compliance and it needs to be more robust. And so I would, I would like to A, make that an annual report. B though, I'd like to have um, staff come back in, um, I guess, November, just give a few months for this data collection. Uh, to provide some better compliance information around the number of complaints that we've received, the method of how it came in, such as was it a phone call to the sheriff's office or internal, uh, the status of those complaints, any denied renewals, and also a process to make it easier for the community to file complaints and just a better internal coordination with both the sheriff's office and the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. I think that these are all doable things and this was all the expectation that the community had and the board had when we uh, first approve these changes to to really address not just bad actors, but those that are operating outside the system to not make it easy for them to get a permit, but make it difficult, but also to have the community when they file a complaint, feel like that it actually, assuming that it's bona fide, actually feel like that they've got uh, uh, a voice in support of the county on the back end to do it. The last part is that given that we just approved this TOT, the community approved the TOT measure, as part of this uh, report back to also look at whether there's an additional uh, compliance need within code compliance to address this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second uh, by I am uh, fully supportive of uh, Supervisor, uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty's uh, suggestion for having that come back in August on, uh, on number 58. All right, thank you. So motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson to adopt the consent agenda with additional direction on items 58 and 73. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously as amended. Thank you. And we'll proceed with our regular agenda and item seven to consider a presentation on the 2022 California fire season by Fire Chief Nate Armstrong as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of General Services. And I'd like to welcome Chief Armstrong to give his presentation. All right. Uh, good morning, Chair Koenig, uh, Supervisors, Mr. Palacios. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here this morning to uh, present to you. I know that you have a very full agenda, so I'll try to be uh, as brief as possible this morning, but did want to take the opportunity just to update you all on where um, the county fire department stands today and where CAL FIRE is kind of looking at the fire season um, moving forward. So just a real quickie uh, review on the county fire department as a whole. 
Uh, the contract's been in place uh, going back uh, to 1948. It's a pretty long partnership between um, CAL FIRE and the county. And the county fire services, the uh, areas of the county that um, the unincorporated portions of the county that aren't serviced by another uh, fire protection agency. And I'm sorry, but if we can get the slide to advance, there we go, beautiful. Um, so what that looks like uh, year round as far as full-time staffing, we do have um, two fire marshal staff as well as two training staff that are um, work year round um, to train the volunteers and so forth, uh, take care of permitting for buildings within the county fire area. Also provide dispatch services year round for um, the county fire department, as well as the year round management of the five volunteer companies. And those exist in the communities of uh, areas of Las Cumbres, Bonnie Dune, Coralitos, uh, Davenport and Loma Prieta. You see on the presentation, I put the wintertime staffing uh, in quotes because the winter seems to have kind of disappeared for us. Uh, continues to get shorter and shorter. What we used to see a um, five to six month fire season in the north end of the state, uh, we're now seeing a nine to 10 month fire season. So that's why we've kind of coined the term now fire year and we just kind of have a peak fire season. So what that um, Amador staffing looks like is in those winter months where uh, Cal Fire's seasonal staff would otherwise be uh, laid off. Um, the County of Santa Cruz picks up the um, the bill essentially for keeping five fire engine staff to provide service throughout that county fire area. And if we could move on, please. And a note on that staffing, continuing that staffing was made possible by the passing of the uh, benefit assessment a couple of years ago that did bring that third person staffing back to the fire engines during that Amador uh, staffing period. As far as our volunteers go, we've had a long-term goal of maintaining 100 volunteers within the county fire department. Unfortunately, we just seem to hover at about that uh, number of about 70. Um, so you see in your presentation there, currently have about 60 of the fire trained um, volunteers. And then we have uh, an additional nine, what we call emergency medical responders or EMRs. And those folks are trained uh, just to the medical level to be able to respond to uh, medical aids within their community, as that is the highest volume of calls that um, our emergency services see. Um, you can see there we added 13 new members in, in 2022. And that just um, kind of uh, replaces 13 folks that we otherwise lost. A lot of folks will seem to fall off after their initial training. They realize it's a fairly significant commitment. And so unfortunately, like I say, we kind of replace the same number that we, we tend to lose through attrition. Uh, some of our challenges with uh, maintaining that volunteer force is the, the training and just the time commitment. It is significant. We realize people's lives are busy. Uh, but we can't drop below a certain level or um, just due to their safety and the community's safety. Uh, we are exploring some other options as far as recruitment goes to bolster those numbers. Um, those look like uh, more of a full-time recruitment um, effort rather than just doing in the fall as we've traditionally done. It's just a, a matter of um, time constraints on our staff. Uh, as well as uh, trying to explore some sort of auxiliary positions that aren't exactly um, emergency response, but may uh, add some value to the county fire um, department mission. And then uh, finally, I have a note there um, as far as not instituting um, single function programs. And what I mean by that is we've had several proposals come forward um, and some of them might come uh, to, to you guys as supervisors looking for kind of a single a minimal training in one particular facet of emergency response and then just allowing those volunteers to do that one thing and never really have any ongoing training and it just as a safety standpoint I, i've yet to have one that we feel comfortable with safely um come forward in terms of um there seems to be a perception that wildland firefighting is not as dangerous as structural firefighting. I can tell you that's definitely not the case. I think we, we have more of our full-time folks injured in the wildland firefighting environment than structure fires. Um, so we just haven't really got to that point of finding a, a happy balance of, of bringing a program like that on. Um, moving on to our mobile equipment replacement. Um, 
So moving into a couple of years ago, you, you know, the county fire department was uh, in kind of a deficit spending. And so we had the, um, the, benefit, the last benefit assessment of 2019 passed. And that's allowed us to move forward with replacing that kind of a hodgepodge of some of the equipment that we had throughout the county and making it more standardized. I do want to talk specifically to some of the types and kinds of fire apparatus that we have. Um, because they are aimed at an all risk uh, mission. We aren't just focused on any one thing as far as structure fires or vegetation fires, rescue, whatever, whatever you might have. Um, and different apparatus suit different needs. So uh, the first thing you see on there is the type one fire engine. Um, I think a lot of people perceive a type one fire engine as just a city fire engine, but we customize these engines um, for a true rural response in mind. Um, you can't tell by the pictures on there because they're kind of a little bit stretched out. That bottom left photo is one of the two um, brand new type one fire engines that will be going to Coralitos and Davenport. Uh, that fire engine actually has a shorter wheelbase than our wildland firefighting engines. Uh, we, we build those things um, so that they can handle our roads. Uh, they do look bigger uh, and they're definitely boxier, but they aren't that much larger than um, our type three wildland firefighting engines. The important thing to note on those type one fire engines is you need those fire engines for um, our ISO rating or insurance services organization that rates uh, communities and what everybody's homeowner's insurance is, is based off of those rates. Um, a large portion of that ISO rating has to do with the ability to move water and a lot of water. And those type one fire engines have a 1500 gallon per minute pump versus the wildland firefighting engines that only have to have a 250 gallon per minute pump. They also carry quite a bit more water, uh, 100 to 200 gallons more than our type three fire engines. Uh, moving on to the type three fire engines that we have uh, that we've been continuing to uh, be able to replace. Um, those are traditionally built with the wildland response in mind. However, what we tend to do in the fire services, we try to make everything similar for whatever reason. So we really build those type three fire engines to also be able to handle structure fires. Our whole, um, our whole intent is to make sure that whatever piece of apparatus is responding, they will be able to handle um, pretty much anything that uh, is thrown at them. Uh, and then the other two portions of the fleet is uh, the water tenders, which is just a giant tank of water on wheels, and um, and our rescue vehicles, which don't require a special license to drive. And that's kind of the first thing that our volunteers um, move into as far as being able to drive an apparatus is that smaller vehicle that responds to medical aids, rescues like over the side kind of things. And our intent throughout the county fire is to make sure that each of the companies has one uh, type one, one type three, one water tender, and one rescue vehicle. And we should be to that standardized point within the next couple of years. That was again, made possible by the passing of the last um, benefit assessment. So real quick on the couple of apparatus that we currently have on order, um, we have two brand new uh, type one fire engines. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, two of those uh, type one fire engines, those will be going to Corleos and Davenport. Our folks were actually back in Wisconsin doing the final inspection on those last week, and we should see them in California here uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we have two new type three fire engines that were on order since last year. Those should have been here by now, but due to supply chain shortages, we won't see them till the beginning of 2023. Those are gonna go to the communities of Bonnie Dune and Davenport. We have two new rescue vehicles that are currently being outfitted. Uh, those are gonna go to the communities of Coralitos and Davenport. And then moving into this next fiscal year, we actually moved up on our vehicle replacement a little bit um, due to the length of time it's taking. It's now taking two years to get a fire engine built. Um, so it had um, a fire and uh, our fifth um, type three fire engine added to this upcoming uh, fiscal year's budget rather than waiting until 2024. Uh, moving on to uh, just the last kind of final updates for county fire. Uh, in this last year, we did update our uh, the county fire handbook. Uh, it was a needed update. Our last revision was in 2015, and this was just um, just an overhaul, kind of um, updating some things like forms, procedures, um, and some of the changes that we'd made in our training standards to try to move um, volunteers through the ranks a little bit faster. Uh, on the county fire master plan, also uh, a little outdated, this um, 
this master plan is the primary uh, role of the Fire Department Advisory Commission, the FDAC. That um, all you supervisors have a commissioner that sits on that. Um, we are working actively on the revision of that, and we're exploring some possibilities to seek input from uh, the public um, as far as uh, internal and external stakeholders, as far as what we want to see um, as that driving force for the county fire department moving forward. And I'm sorry if we can advance the slide again. Um, I just put a note here of some kind of current advancements based on the previous master plan uh, that we're still working under, and that's embracing technology. So the county fire website, unfortunately, is outdated. It's been a little um, difficult to maintain. And so we've, um, we're working on uh, migrating that to a new environment right now and making it a little bit more um, present with the times, trying to add the ability for volunteer candidates to be able to apply through that um, portal and just generally be a little more current. Uh, we've instituted um, with the other fire agencies in the county a tablet command software, which is uh, an incident management platform. And we're also working on in instituting a new um, statistics and um, kind of fire prevention software that'll help us catalog some of our efforts a little better. Uh, moving on to some fire prevention measures on the CAL FIRE side. So in that photo there, sorry it's small, but you can see that little machine out in front of the gentleman in the, in the woods there. That is the county fire purchased um, masticator uh, that was purchased this last year. Uh, purchased by the county, we're operating it in the county fire area with CAL FIRE uh, firefighters during the fuel reduction season. And what that's given us the ability to do is it, it clears about a quarter an acre an hour with a decent operator, I guess. Um, uh, we did put about 100 hours on that on that piece of equipment since January, uh, and it worked on three separate projects in the county fire, or sorry, four separate projects so far, three in the Bonnie Dune area, and then one on West Ridge near Loch Lomond. Um, the interesting thing about it is that we, um, as county, as Cal Fire builds out vegetation management pro projects, we have to do it a couple of years in advance due to the amount of time it takes to go through the CEQA process or California Environmental Quality Act. Not a lot of our current projects were built for mechanical disturbance. So all of our future projects, knowing that we have this piece of equipment now, will be um, written with that um, with that in mind so that we can utilize this on more projects throughout the county. Also looking at um, kind of getting a more robust uh, uh, pool of operators to include some of our volunteers so that we can continue those fuel reduction efforts uh, year round. Uh, just a couple of pictures so you can see these uh, these firefighters out in in some brush. That's kind of typical um, vegetation understory that we see through a lot of the county. And if you go to the next slide, that is the same piece. Sorry, it's taken from a different perspective, but that's the same piece after a couple hours of work. And you can see it's a nice little park-like setting. So it's a it's a really great tool, and we hope to continue to be able to use it more. Uh, moving forward into some curtain burners. So these are a really interesting um, tool that we've been able to recently acquire. Uh, Cal Fire as a whole on the, on the states on the statewide um, owns ten of these curtain burners. And what it is, you can see, it kind of looks like a like a roll off dumpster. It's got it introduces a curtain of air that provides a more um, more complete combustion. It also keeps um, those embers and smoke and everything inside of that uh, vessel while it burns. And so you see, we see very little emission. We see very little embers flying out. And what that does for us is gives us the ability to consume a lot of dead and down fuel. Um, and it allows us to burn later into the summer uh, granted, we still we keep people monitoring these things. We have a fire engine there or some source of water, uh, but it does allow us to burn when otherwise uh, burning season is suspended. Um, like, I said, like I have here, one curtain burner can burn up to about 20 tons of material per day. Um, again, that has to do with orientation and a good operator, I'm sure. Um, but the one thing that we see is efficiency. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, like I said, Cal Fire owns 10 of these. Um, our staff was able to acquire three of those 10. And this is the last time I'm ever going to talk about it publicly because I don't want the other units to catch on uh, what we're doing here. Um, so having those three, um, having those three curtain burners 
is a lot more efficient. We can be burning in one while we're unloading one and loading another one. Uh, and if you'd seen in the previous photo, we don't need to go back, but what comes out of that is basically a small pile of ash and char. And we're working with some um, outside folks right now that might have a use for that char. So it might be a very sustainable thing. And we do have um, projects throughout the county that we're looking at using these on. Um, we're working really closely with the fire safe councils and some other land uh, managers with the use of these. And I never miss an opportunity to plug our fire safe councils. They're an absolutely tremendous group of folks. They're doing really great work through the county. So thank uh, your board for the support of those folks as well. Uh, one more kind of note on fire prevention. Cal Fire was able to purchase in place um, five new um, 10,000 gallon tanks. We do place three of those in Santa Cruz County. Um, they're metal tanks. They're a lot more resilient than some of those plastic or composite ones. Uh, they're placed in some remote areas of the county and they've either all been filled or are currently in the process of being filled now. And those are for fire protection purposes only. So finally moving forward into the fire year outlook. Um, it looks grim as always. I'm sure you guys have gotten used to that. Um, Looking at this past rainy season that we had is interesting. It's, um, you know, I'm sure many of you remember and are probably maybe monitoring as much as I am. Started out with a good bang in November and early December. It seemed like we were going to, it's like the optimist in me wanted to say, hey, the drought might be over. Then came January through March. Uh, and what we experienced, um, the one uh, stat that I saw was it was the driest first quarter in the Bay Area in 107 years. Uh, and many of you guys might remember uh, that period. We didn't, we didn't get much of anything. Had some 80 and 90 degree days, as a matter of fact, I think in February. So um, then we came back in the late spring and did get a little bit more rain. So depending on where you sit in the county, um, you may have seen close to an average rainfall year. Um, due to the number of microclimates and geography that we have, it just, it varies greatly throughout the county. Uh, where I live in the San Lorenzo Valley, we did get 50 inches of rain, which is great. It's right at that average, but not the whole county saw that. The other thing being, while we did get um, those brief spouts of heavy rain, it's not enough to crush the long-term drought. And we're seeing that in our fuels uh, right now as we continue to um, take fuel moisture samples uh, throughout the county. Uh, we see those continuously being at, uh, either at or uh, very near uh, historic lows. And what we look at those, um, those live fuel moistures for is basically their resilience to fire spread. The other component of that is the dead fuel, and we're seeing a, a drastic uh, increase in just dead fuels, which, as you can imagine, the fuel moisture of those is relatively zero. Um, so there's a lot of dead fuel, a lot of very receptive fuel in the county that um, may provide for fire spread. Uh, looking at some of the predictive services kind of outlooks for the year, they've been spot on so far. Um, they talked about monsoonal moisture, which is, um, which is what you get the lightning out of. Monsoonal moisture sounds good, but sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's dry. And that's uh, what we saw in this last about 10 day period, um, maybe not locally here, but throughout the state is right in line with predictions that there was gonna be flows that moved from the south to the north um, and had a lot of uh, lightning strikes throughout the other portions of the state. We've avoided them so far and some of the uh, local, um, more local for us uh, outlook has said um, that we should see um, fewer extended heat waves, which if you look back at 2020, when we had the catastrophic fire season here locally, that was spurred by one of the things uh, was we had like a week long, terrible heat wave right before that dry lightning came through, um, really prepping a lot of the fuels. And we should see a lot fewer of those this year, uh, according to models, uh, should also see a little more prevalent um, coastal influence moisture. So hopefully um, hopefully we, we continue to see that. We have um, what the current outlook says is that July into August will be above normal uh, fire potential throughout the region. And that, um, oh, that's it actually that I had on that. <laughs> so um, as you see right now, all, all the grasses throughout the county are already cured um, and it's a little early or they hit that 
point a little earlier in the year. Um, so we'll just, we will see, we're, we're obviously already seeing those, those initial attack vegetation fires already starting. Um, looking at kind of some current trends, if we can go to the next slide. Um, these figures are as of a week ago today. I'll probably get another update today. Those numbers will obviously all be higher, but we're seeing the trend stay consistent that uh, we're seeing fewer fires statewide and for fewer acres than the same time frame last year, which is uh, favorable for us. And I'm sure kind of a result of those late season rains that, hit, that have hit kind of throughout the state. Uh, and that same goes that statewide and then in the northern region, which we fall in in Santa Cruz County, we see the same thing. We're seeing fewer fires for fewer acres than the same time period last year. So that's encouraging. Uh, I think I just have one or two more slides here on uh, Outlook as far as resources. Everybody is always asking, what, are, what do we have more this year than we did last year? And unfortunately, not much. Um, so what's happening on the aircraft side of things? We're seeing more of those, uh, I have S70I there, that's what everybody knows is the Black Hawks or the Firehawks. Uh, we're seeing more of those placed into service statewide. Uh, the one that's closest to us, that's uh, right by Lexington Reservoir, um, is still one of those current old Vietnam era Hueys. Um, that will be replaced by the Firehawk later this year. And it'll unfortunately be moving to Moffett Field then, uh, just due to its size but it does fly a lot faster and it carries four times the amount of water. So we think that trade-off is probably gonna be good. Um, what we've seen as far as staffing, we don't have extra bodies, uh, any more bodies than we have in the last couple of years. Uh, we hope to see some more come through uh, the governor's budget, but what we have done um, this last couple of years, uh, last year and this year, was uh, being able to bring back our seasonal staffing earlier through an augmentation uh, piece through the Department of Finance. And so, whereas normally we wouldn't be bringing back our peak firefighters until like right now, we were able to bring them back in April. And I'm sure with the recent fire activity, you can appreciate that that was a, a good move being able to bring those folks back early. Uh, like I said, we're just waiting on uh, the final governor's budget to see if we get any um, uh, base level staffing increases and um, hand crews continue to be uh, an issue. Uh, you know, we have 200 and some, a little over 200 funded uh, hand crews statewide between the relationship with CDCR, relationship with, um, with three C's and then our own um, seasonal firefighter hand crews that we've been at, begun to utilize the last couple of years. Of those 200 funded crews, Statewide, we're currently looking at anywhere between like 60 or 70 or staffed at any given time, just due to the shortage of, of personnel to put on them. And just for, for context, 60 to 70 crews, we used to put that on one fire. And that's what we have in the entire state right now. So, so we're hurting in the, in the crew world for sure. Um, we are projected to uh, begin acquisition of some more helicopters, bulldozers, fire engines, everything at the statewide level to be able um, for that surge capacity in the peak fire season. Just a couple of hindrances on that. One, I just told you about lead time. It's taken two years to build a fire engine. So it'll be a couple of years before we see those. Also, we, they don't come with the personnel for them. So we're constantly pushing to get personnel added for all that extra equipment. Uh, and finally, in summary, it wouldn't be a fire year outlook without a look at the uh, Sierra snowpack. There it is. It's uh, non-existent as of today. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you very much, Chief Armstrong. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, my, my thanks to you, Chief Armstrong, and Michael Beaton, the County Director of General Services. I have several questions, and you've maybe sort of answered them, uh, and I think I'll just ask them one by one, and so maybe you could get to the direct. Um, on the, the, are the 13 new volunteers a part of the total 71, or is it 71 plus 13? They are part of the total 71. Okay. And regarding the LAFCO fire, um, fire feasibility study, do you have a time frame for the study and what will be the process uh, to work with the fire department advisory commission or FDAC um, and the fire districts to discuss the study? Do you have a time frame? I, I don't wanna speak out of turn on that one. I don't know if Director Beaton might have a better answer as we're kind of working on, on right the actual um, proposals for them and when that okay. might be awarded. Okay. Well, yeah, and what's what's the in addition to that is what, what's the process to renegotiate the Cal Fire and County Fire contract too? 
We're going ahead. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services for the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, so to talk about the uh, CAL FIRE agreement, uh, it is currently under the, uh, just finishing its second year of a three-year contract. Uh, we'll begin negotiations regarding uh, renewal of that agreement for another potential three-year term, uh, probably starting in about uh, three months or so uh, with CAL FIRE. Uh, related to the LAFCO study, uh, it is an item that has been brought to the Fire Department Advisory Commission for review, as well as we are still working with LAFCO to do a, a potential special fire study uh, to look at countywide services, uh, not just those provided through the CSA 48 and CSA 4, but all county fire uh, districts throughout the county. Uh, that is currently underway. Uh, we are working with LAFCA right now to develop what that scope of work might be uh, to potentially be issued through our uh, local, uh, through LAFCO. Okay, and, and F, uh, FDAC is gonna be involved in the process or will there um, input be taken into consideration as part of the process then? Yes, um, the Fire Department Advisory Commission, their scope and role is specifically related to the CSA 48 area and the CSA 4 uh, area. Um, we have reviewed uh, some of the annexation um, uh, areas that were recommended in the LAFCO report. Uh, they have not opined as far as whether support or no support uh, for the different areas, but they are aware of it and it's something that we continue to have on our agenda with the Fire Department Advisory Commission, uh, but they will have a significant input into the process as we move forward. Would you hope then that the county master plan would be completed or the new and updated uh, when do you, what's your best projection? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the fire, uh, the fire department master plan, we are actually hoping to have it done before the, uh, uh, so we have a better input from the community as far as what they expect and what they wanna see their fire department services as. Um, timing wise, uh, I believe that uh, we're gonna run in concert with what the special fire study is gonna have. So I do believe that we will have the, at least a draft uh, for your board to consider for the fire department uh, master plan uh, around the same time that LAFCO uh, will be, I, I believe concluding or almost concluding their special fire study for fire department services countywide. Yeah, okay, and and maybe Chief Armstrong, I think it just on 60 minutes, it might've been a rerun about the big, uh, the whole 3000 gallons or something. Is that the one that's gonna go to Moffett Field? It, it, there was a, Are you, uh, there, if there you're was talking some concern minutes. about how they were allocated and there was a lot of fires going on at the same time the CZU fire was going on, but um, is that where that would be headquartered then in Moffett Field? So that's a slightly different deal, but it also dovetails into uh, a, a new effort by CAL FIRE is, um, so that came about in about 2020 and those helicopters were primarily out of um, Southern California. They were um, operated in LA and Orange County from what I remember, and they were actually funded by, um, by electrical utilities. Um, so those are the big Chinook uh, helicopters. Um, those are still in place in Southern California, something that um, CAL FIRE did this year, and I think the number is 14. We have exclusive use um, contracts with 14 of similar large Chinook or Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopters that are able to drop a significantly amount more water. Those are committed purely to Cal, just like they'd be a CAL FIRE aircraft. And we saw this last week in, um, we had a, 20 acre fire in San Mateo County threatening a lot of homes uh, right off 280. I think we had four of those large helicopters on that fire. So they're, they are available to us locally. And they, they we really, hope to not see them is the thing. They, they really operate very well in the night, at night too. Is that correct? Uh, it all depends on conditions. So as far as night flying aircraft goes, um, where they are, would be most effective is stopping a rapidly expanding vegetation fire, maybe keeping it from going to that major incident where we saw some comments about the use of those on major fires is their, their effectiveness at night on something that's already 100,000 plus acres is still kind of in debate, but they are, they may be available for that purpose. Okay, thank you for the up, upgrade and um, yeah, everybody's on pins and needles. Uh, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, sir. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Mr. Supervisor Mr. Thank you, I'll, I'll briefly just answer one of Supervisor McPherson's questions is that the item, the feasibility study comes to LAFCO for approval of the contract on August 3rd at that meeting, just so you can get a sense of the timing of that's kind of the kickoff of that process. 
And Chief, uh, great appreciation to you and your team. Um, I feel like congratulating you again on your current role. And let me just say uh, that that I've, I do have a lot of concerns with what the state may do in the renegotiation of the contract. I have concerns over the long-term viability with Amador. And I uh, would encourage, and I know you will, but uh, active participation in these countywide feasibility studies as LAFCO, as agencies look for consolidation and mergers, you need to have a seat at the table. Uh, as I know you will, but also we need to be looking at the long-term viability of fire protection within this county. And and it's and to me, it's unclear with some of the state investments, a lot in equipment, less in people, uh, and in an attempt to maybe renegotiate some of these agreements in some of these communities that, that the long-term viability of our current uh, funding mechanism is really present. And so I'm concerned, uh, I, meaning that I, that I think that we need to look more toward uh, some of these mergers and consolidations that are on the table in order to ensure that that some of these rural communities uh, continue to have that level of fire protection. So um, I recognize that you represent various roles in your current capacity, but um, as we work on these renegotiations, um, to the degree that you can look into a crystal ball and see the long-term financial commitment from the state or not, th that, that it really is going to dovetail in with the need to, for these consolidations. So uh, that's just my my pitch to ensure that you have an active role in this discussion at LAFCO and with these agencies that are coming forward in CSA 48 to look at current mergers so that we can have soft landing should there be uh, a pullback from the state on some of these agreements. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief, um, for the presentation. Good news about the new equipment and hopefully the weather forecasts uh, hold, uh, as you mentioned. Two questions uh, for you. One is, uh, what are we doing to create a pipeline in of firefighters uh, in order to make sure, you know, we're, every industry in Santa Cruz County is facing this challenge where it's an expensive place to live. And so um, it's difficult to recruit and retain firefighters. So first question is, what are, what are we doing to ensure we have an adequate supply of firefighters who can uh, live and work in this county? Yeah, and as part of the um, FDAC, they do have a volunteer recruitment subcommittee, uh, have done, done a couple of surveys of uh, items that of current and former volunteers um, to find items that they feel might uh, bring in that pool. A couple of those things are things I already mentioned, kind of having that year-round recruitment. Um, adjusting the training portion a little bit to be able to get people in sooner. Um, we realize in looking at the past that um, some folks' interest falls off um, in from the time that they sign up and they say they want to do it and then the time that we actually are able to get them through their initial training. So we're trying to speed up, kind of lower that bar of entry so that they sign up and right away they're, they're in the pool, they're getting some sort of training before they get the big formal training. Uh, that's kind of the most current one. As I said, as we move forward um, uh, with the County Fire website, and some other marketing tools that we have, digital marketing that we hope to um, that we hope to put in place. We're hoping that we're able to pull people in right now. To to be quite frank, the application process is a little bit cumbersome on folks. So we're really looking to streamline that process and really capture people um, that may have interest that we're currently missing. It's ba basically trying to uh, really retain the whole pool that may have interest, uh, as well as, like I say, going after some folks that may not know it's there through some digital marketing that we've never done before. And this, I, my question was primarily around the paid firefighters. So you have oh. trouble recruiting and retaining. Uh, Gosh, I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult right now. Um, I was just having a chat outside in the hall here before we started. And the, um, the workforce seems to have dried up a little bit. Um, and that's not unique to Cal Fire. It's not unique to the County Fire Department. That's unique to a lot of public service agencies right now. We, we're seeing... Um, we're seeing fire departments and police departments offering signing bonuses, which I, I, I can't believe where, you know, a lot of us, when we started 20 or plus years ago, had to apply with 10,000 other people for two jobs. Um, and we're seeing the opposite of that now. So I, I wish I had an answer for you, Supervisor Coonerty. It's, it's a statewide problem that, that we're all looking at right now. Okay. Appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if there's worth partnering with the various school districts or the county office of education try to create a pipeline and let people know early that there's an opportunity here to to serve Absolutely. the community and 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 make a good living um 
is to, uh, staying in the community and serving in Cal Fire. Uh, the, my second question was, uh, I think I appreciate the efforts that you're, you're engaging in to reduce fuel. Uh, and we also are working with uh, property owners through Firewise and other uh, efforts to reduce fuel. Do we have a sense of like what the number of acres is and how many acres we've addressed? Like, is are we, are we working based on data or are we just doing sort of project by project where there's funding and opportunity? Um, like how do we know how big the problem is and how, how much of an effort we've made at re reducing some of that fuel? Sure. I, man, I wish I had a, a square number for you and I'd be happy to get it to you. Um, the one major so we have several different varieties of projects that um, Cal Fire itself does. Um, those usually be in, you know, fuel reduction, the shaded fuel breaks that you see, like the photos in, in, um, in the presentation um, through um, prescribed burning, which was minimal this um, spring here locally. Um, but the one major thing that we're seeing, and it's kind of the easiest to track acreage on, is the grants. Um, so like I said, that that quote unquote winter period keeps getting shorter and shorter for us. That's been the time that the CAL FIRE folks have been able to commit 100% to fuel reduction. Uh, and that period's only two or three months now. So. I want to say that locally, our, our folks weren't able to treat more than about 100 to 200 acres this fire this winter season. But what we're really seeing is the management of grants locally. Um, my staff is managing a little over 28 million dollars worth of grants uh, that have to do with fire prevention, fuel reduction, forest health resilience, and the vast majority of those are here within Santa Cruz County through um, the RCD, the local fire safe councils, and those are actually measurable. And we could bring some numbers back to the board as far as how many acres are treated and so forth. Great. I mean, I think it's a, probably a, a a good thing for the county operational plan to have that as a goal, have the number number of acres and the number uh, that, that we're able to address through these programs and then be able to to chip away at it a little bit uh, every year in order to, to reduce the overall fuel capacity and danger. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Great. Uh, thanks for all the work you do out there. It's uh, uh, it's been really difficult the last few years, and uh, I guess the on the burned out area where the fires were about two years ago, uh, that that area should be fairly safe. And uh, uh, as far as another fire starting in that area, right? I mean, there's when it's burned out, it doesn't have a lot of fuel. But how many years does that actually last, though? Do we have any idea? Yeah, um, I wish I could say it was totally safe, but unfortunately, what you firefighters are terrible. We're always doom and gloom, right? Um, what we have in that area is a lot of dead fuel that is ripe to burn. And we also have a lot of new growth of brush and you put the, so basically that entire landscape has changed and we're seeing some fuel types in there that weren't as present before. Um, so we do have that combination of new types of brush as well as a lot of dead fuel. So I wouldn't say that it's completely safe. I'd say that um, through the areas that um, had a little more complete combustion or burn in them that those might be slightly uh, reduced um, kind of fire problem in there. But for a large portion of the perimeter of the fire, like right on the fringes of it, was really what we call a kind of a dirty burn. It didn't burn real complete. Um, it's real patchwork mosaic. And so you do have a lot of dry fuel left immediately around that fire area from two years ago that's still just as dangerous today as it was then, if not a little more so. Right. Okay. And then I guess uh, it must be... Uh, difficult to recruit actual helicopter pilots. Are they full-time firefighters or are they on call? Yeah, so um, the the pilots for the CAL FIRE helicopters are actual CAL FIRE employees, and um, we see a lot of veterans. And so that's part, it's not the reason that we went to Blackhawks. Um, 
but it's also a benefit that we went to those Blackhawks because we have a lot of exiting veterans from the military right now sure. that have a lot of experience flying those aircraft. And we capitalize on that by recruiting those folks and getting them into the system. So they are full time. They work year round um, and they're trained specifically for fire and rescue missions. So if they're not flying a helicopter, they're a regular fire uh, fighter. No, they're they're just they're there to fly the helicopter. They're fire trained, but they're a pilot and pilot only. OK. Yeah. OK. And then uh, I saw something on the screen there. It kind of. Uh, I, I I missed it. Something about mon, monsoon rains. What yeah, was that about? yeah, and that was something that that we're seeing as far as the the long term models that show monsoonal moisture, which is where you get your thunder uh, thunderstorms and lightning out of monsoonal moisture. So they can't be specific enough in these long term outlooks to tell us where they're going to land. We get so we don't know if we'll get the brunt of it or we'll get kind of an edge. We don't know if it'll be wet or if it'll be dry but just know that there is that possibility of some sort of monsoonal activity coming through. They're saying continuing through the end of July and that's statewide. That's not specific to Santa Cruz County. So they know the target is on California. Just don't know exactly where within yeah. California. <laughs> okay. And the, the last question, uh, what was a couple of days ago in Watsonville, there was uh, ash in the air. Was that a, a lightning fire type thing uh, somewhere? Yeah, there was, uh, gosh, there was right near the slough. I believe there was about a two acre grass fire the other day. Um, that was, uh, it, it wasn't immediately threatening anything. They were able to stop it relatively quick, but you probably had a little bit of an onshore flow, which creates put that ash out in the air and raining down on folks. Yeah. And I, I guess, uh, in, uh, over by Madeira and all that, they had a lot of lightning. Uh, quite, a, quite a bit more. Yeah, but quite a few fires are minimal. What we're seeing so far statewide, quite a few fires, but they've all stayed small, um, which is great for this time of year. And it, again, is kind of um, probably testament to some of that late season, late spring season moisture that we had come through, keeping those fuels dampened a little bit right now. Had we got that lightning surge, Two months from now, we'd probably be looking at another scenario like we had statewide in 2020. Well, anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much, and God bless you and all the men and women uh, in the fire department. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. One question for you, Chief Armstrong. Um, and we hear a lot about concerns for evacuation routes um, from constituents. What is the best way uh, to get new evacuation routes established? Ooh, man, that's a big partnership. I know, um, uh, I don't want to speak for OR3, but OR3 was just working on a project for exactly that. Uh, unfortunately, funding sources have changed. So it's really um, incumbent upon all of the agencies involved between OR3, ourselves, um, um, Public Works, to really be nimble and able to spring on, on as we plan these projects, being able to pivot to new funding sources or kind of other options for creative involvement from the community to allow those. Another issue that we see is some folks just don't want to grant um, passage through their property, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but we'll continue to try to work through those scenarios to try and enhance. You know, I'd hate to ever see an issue like happened in Butte County in 2018, where you have a huge community with only one way out. And we do have several of those, unfortunately, in this uh, in the county. Right. So our office response recovery and resilience applying for grants obviously your team applying for grants um as far as citizens citizens themselves i mean should they get involved with the fire safe council and firewise to help identify those projects and elevate them then um to your team 100 percent, yeah and we work very closely with the rcd and the fire safe councils on anything that comes forward and trying to support their efforts financially or however we can support it operationally great thank you thank you sir all right do we have any public comment on this item Yeah, please approach the podium. Thank you, um, Chief Armstrong. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos in the mountains. And I noticed that none of you asked him about the problems that are ongoing with the volunteers that have been dismissed or harassed to the point that they resigned. 
I talked with you earlier about Mr. Kaufman's letter, and none of you asked him about it, so I'm going to ask the question. Chief Armstrong, as the chief of county fire, why are uh, why has county fire lost six well-trained volunteers? Some of them resigned because of uh, harassment or the way they were treated during and after the CZU fire. One, Mr. Matthew Kaufman recently was dismissed, not put on suspension, but dismissed because he simply questioned Cal Fire and what happened in the CZU fire. I want you to explain that to the board and to the public this morning. It is reducing the well-trained volunteers that we depend on who stayed behind in the CZU fire when Cal Fire was not there and they saved their communities working with volunteers who were their neighbors. I want an answer this morning. I also have questions about access and thank you Supervisor Koenig for bringing up the access. What is going on with State Parks Big Basin? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm asking you, uh, Chief Armstrong, uh, what is going on with the access to Big Basin for the last chance road? Part of what is happening with our volunteer recruitment is the it's the poor treatment that they are given. I have personally witnessed Mr. Beaton, who is part of County Fire Volunteer, left in the station at Coralitos with a couple of other well-trained volunteers. And the Cal Fire staff went out on a County Fire engine and left the well-trained volunteers sitting in the station. Is there anyone on Zoom that wishes to comment on this item? Oh, let's just take finish public comment and. We do have speakers on Zoom. LS, your microphone is now available. Thank you. I'm a resident of Felton. Our house was half a mile from the CZU fire at the time it was contained, and we owe that existence of our house um, to Cal Fire um, and certainly without local volunteers and as controversial as it is and I don't have a strong opinion to locals who stayed in dangerous areas to slow down the fire I don't I don't know that Cal Fire could have saved us alone my comment is that I know a young lady with experience with wildfire in another state she moved to Santa Cruz with the dream of fighting wildfire but the cost of housing she's finding herself working two jobs trying to find a third I know she's not the only person. She's stuck with limited career opportunities without financial support or education. Um, and so she can't volunteer for years to work her way into a paid position. I'd love to see some community fundraising to try to get folks a stipend so that you can have volunteers for longer. The turnover can't be cost effective and you lose skilled volunteers. I would also love to see volunteers get some support at the county level or from CAL FIRE to encourage employers to hold their jobs and accommodate their volunteer work by giving them makeup hours to keep a steady income. Uh, with the workforce shortage, you might have some leverage to get a list of employers who've made a vow to support the volunteers. I know a lot of employers, even large companies that have the finances, don't want to give overtime hours. Um, and if this is already being done, I apologize for my ignorance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Carolyn Garrett, answer Becky Steinbruner's pertinent questions. Stop treating members of the public who are well informed like we don't exist. Those are key questions. I would like to add some, um, it's pretty outrageous. And the way you treat women asking questions, right? So that was an informative presentation that raises a lot of questions. And I'd like to give you some references that seriously need, need to be investigated. We need to remove some known but rarely publicized causes of all these fires. One reference is geoengineeringwatch.org. 
and the weather manipulation that is taking place with patents destroying the ozone, causing the droughts. Geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington. Another known cause is PG&E's defective power lines and policies that they, they continue. Another source of fires is the so-called smart meters, fires and explosions. Fatalities and these smart meters are on utility poles where all of these 4G, soon to be 5G antennas are. I'm quoting from the stopsmartmeters.org. Fatalities and serious injuries have been caused by smart meter fires and explosions. Following fire incidents, hundreds of thousands of smart meters were recalled in Saskatchewan. Thank you, Ms. William, your microphone is now available. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. This is not William Hall from Mulholland. This is Douglas Deach. I am a long-term resident, uh, Hudson Lane, Deach Drive at the back, uh, the boundary of Cabrillo College. Uh, uh, Chief Armstrong, uh, could you please listen to this? I have a question. First of all, I'd like to generally commend law enforcement and our fire departments for doing an excellent job. It's a tough job, and particularly now. And uh, so generally, I'm very pleased with what's going on. In my specific case, where I lived for 50 years, uh, what we have is a problem dealing with existing county laws, which are not being enforced, specifically uh, flammable access from public and private access roads of uh, 10 feet uh, horizontal, 15 feet vertical. Uh, I've spoken with the last two uh, uh, fire department uh, chiefs in Central Fire. Uh, they basically refuse to follow their oath of office and law to follow these laws, a county fire code. Uh, so what I'd like to know is, is it in this their jurisdiction to be following these laws? And as a board of supervisors, I've uh, tried to contact them we contact you uh, to convey this uh, to you because it's it's a threatening, you know, a, a unsafe access, ingress and egress, as uh, uh, Chair Coney was talking about, is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I have developed the property up there, probably $30 million worth of homes, which has a well, maybe $300,000 potential tax revenue to the county, private road, privately uh, maintained. And all we'd like to do is have our laws maintained and the owners at the bottom of Hudson Lane, who are not in our road group, to uh, be cited for their violations of that. So they will change it. And if we have to go to court, we will have documented the violations that were there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Deach. We have no further speakers for this item, Chair. All right, thank you. Then I'll return to the board for action. Did uh, Chief, did you want an opportunity to respond? To we, norm we normally to don't engage in a dialogue uh, sorry, we're <coughs> during our communications. I'm sure the Chief will be happy to answer questions outside the meeting. Great. All right, thank you. Then I'll, re I'll return to the board for, <coughs> for we'll move action. The recommended action. I don't know if, I don't know if we just, need to. Yeah, I believe it's just, just a, Accept. Do we need to ex accept this item? No, there's no action necessary. Okay, very well. Thank you, Chief Armstrong, for your report. I uh, will proceed to item eight, public hearing to consider County Service Area 48 and County Service Area 4, Fire Protection Special Benefit Assessment Charge Report for fiscal year 22-23 and adopt resolutions confirming said reports for CSA 48-2020, CSA 48, and CSA 4 as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of General Services. Director Beaton, will you be providing an overview? Uh, thank you, Board. Uh, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services, just available for staff uh, as support to this item. If there's any questions from the Board or the public. Thank you. Are there any questions from members of the Board? Seeing none, any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item? Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I'm a 
uh, taxpayer in CSA 48. Um, first of all, you need to open public hearing. <laughs> and second of all, the only reason I found out about this is because I happened to look in the legal notices of the Santa Cruz Sentinel on um, June 18th. I saw that this was going to happen. There is absolutely no notice on County Fire website about this, about the budget, the proposed budget, nothing. And I understand that websites take maintenance, but the County Fire did put a, a press release on the homepage of the County Fire website about um, the close of burn season on April 6th. So it is possible. Public has had no notice about this hearing at all. I'm opposed to these increases. Um, I, uh, it, and it isn't that I don't support fire protection. <laughs> it's the way that the money is being managed, mismanaged, and really um, for all the talk about FDAC, they really are not given the information in a timely manner to be able to make recommendations to your board. There's no notice on the, um, this is the first today I've heard of the draft master plan being open for public comment. There's nothing on the website. How are you expecting the public to be to give meaningful input when no one even knows it's happening? I am opposed to the increases. The special benefit assessment was put through, in my opinion, illegally. It was an assessment district. It was tacked on to, visibly on the ballot, a county service area, which is a completely different funding mechanism. Special, special benefit assessments are illegal under government code 5078.2B that clearly states you cannot levy special benefit assessments for fire suppression on state responsibility lands you, that are in... To be clear, I will officially open the public hearing and uh, please note, uh, make sure that Ms. Steinberger's comment of opposition is added to the record. Seeing no one else here in chambers that wishes to address us on this item, is there anyone on Zoom? We do have one speaker on Zoom. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I'm also opposed to these increases. And I would like to see Becky Steinbruner, who is very knowledgeable and has been a volunteer firefighter, uh, do a presentation on this topic of fires. The point she just made that special benefit assessments, the way you're doing it, are illegal. And Will anyone on the Board of Supervisors address these serious issues? I am, I, I just over and over feel like the public is not being well represented. The well being of the public is being harmed through many, many aspects. And what are causing all these fires? This is not natural weather we're experiencing. It is not wise to let PG&E cause fires. I'm opposed to this and answer Becky Steinbrunner's questions. It is not... Uh, appropriate that you say, oh, they can be answered in the call. The public needs to hear. You are supposed to represent the public, not special interests. Those are my comments. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers for this item, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, if I could, um, as one who worked on um, CSA 48 and the update, um, we went through all the legal processes, uh, looked at them all, and I think that they were fully met. And I guess it's for me to ask the county council in one 
one word answer or not, uh, did we follow the legal procedures that were necessary to uh, upgrade and establish uh, CSA 48? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. We, we've been litigating this case um, with the petitioner for almost two years now, and, and petitioner has not been able to move it forward. I've seen no indication of any illegality or any impropriety as associated with the election proceedings or with the implementation of the electorate's decision. And frankly, we just look forward to getting into court to uh, continue to defend the case at some point. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. We have a, a motion. Second. Second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. This item passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you very much, Director Beaton. We'll now proceed with item nine to consider the approval of final recommended awards from the collective of results and evidence-based investments request for proposals process. Consider approval of three months of transition funding for fiscal year 21, 22 core programs not recommended for funding in fiscal year 22, 23. Direct the human services department to return to the board on or before December 13th, 2022 with an update and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum the Director of Human Services. Welcome, Director Morris, and uh, take it away. Uh, good morning. Thank you. And good morning, Chair Koenig, uh, Randy Morris, Human Services Director. I'm joined by Kimberly Peterson, the Deputy Director, though today's presentation is much shorter than the one that brought us in front of you on June 7th. So I will be the one presenting today, but uh, Kimberly is here with a lot of materials in case there is a question and answer so we can be responsive. Um, on June 7th, just to briefly catch us all up, uh, your board approved our recommended actions of moving the slate of recommended awards forward. But you also gave us one additional direction, and that was to remove one particular grant and to come back today with a recommendation to how to repurpose those funds within the core allocation. And you also gave us um, one last additional direction, which is to return today and speak to how the contracting oversight would look, which we um, speak to. I do wanna make sure to remind your board and the public listening that this is a um, dual jurisdiction funding um, relationship with the city of Santa Cruz. So I do wanna make sure everyone is aware that that afternoon, Kimberly and I co-presented to the Santa Cruz City Council and the city council also approved the recommended actions and they gave very specific direction to the city manager's office to return at their budget hearings on June 14th to look for a new funding source to try to help support funding for the community-based organizations that were not funded. So they had a different but very specific direction. At the city council's June 14th budget hearings, the city council adopted their $1,080,000 of appropriations to the core allocation and they deferred the request until this afternoon where Kimberly and I will be to look for new funding uh, to try to help support those agencies that were not funded. I'm sharing that background because bundled this afternoon on consent is our uh, core funding allocation and the cities as approved by the council. And this afternoon we'll be in front of the council uh, to close out this discussion and to also have discussion, which is part of our recommended actions to find some new funding to help support some of the agencies. Um, I, um, so this brings us to today. A short presentation. The first is we have modified the recommended actions that we brought to you on June 7th, and we essentially have two uh, new ones. One is an adjustment in those who are being recommended for awards, which I'll speak to in a minute. And the second is we did identify a $500,000 one-time funding source, which I'll speak to what that source is for some um, a second action in front of you. Uh, the second agenda item is a very quick update on what happened in the appeals process. Um, and I wanna bring the community's attention and remind your board that in the materials is a letter from the General Services Department Director, Michael Beaton, his team managed the appeal and he is here and available to answer any questions about the appeal process if necessary. And then finally, just sort of walk through what the next steps are depending on the direction of your board and the final direction this afternoon from the council. Okay, so that brings us to um, the first of the modified recommend actions in front of your board today. I want to underline that this recommended action is all within the parameters of 
the RFP that your board and the city council approved. We have taken the direction to eliminate one grant that we were given on June 7th and come back to recommend how to repurpose that money. And secondarily, we have taken the board approved RFP parameter of staff discretion to recommend up to a 10% reduction in the grant awards to all applicants. And we have come back to recommend moving to what was a 3% reduction to a full 10% reduction. So by putting those two funding uh, streams together, it allowed us the opportunity to follow the rank order of those who applied in the medium and large tier where the biggest competition was and fund one extra large grant. And that is the Senior Network Services Aging and Community Program. That is a program that in their application stated that if funded by local general fund core money, they would be able to leverage state and federal area agency on aging money, an issue that was brought up as an area of concern for not getting funding before. So this recommended action allows us to fund this organization. There was not enough funds to look at a second large application. So we then turned to the medium tier where there was quite a bit of competition. And because those grant applications are much smaller, we were able to fund in this recommended action, the next four highest ranks programs. Um, this list is not in rank order, but I just wanted to say the first in the medium is the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, which is a mentoring program. The second is Family Services Agency, who is the regional 988 provider, soon to go live under federal action to provide suicide prevention hotline to the community. The third is Community Ventures Guaranteed Income Program, which proposed to serve 30 Latinx families in the communities that are low income to help them with um, financial literacy, guaranteed income, and to help support them um, become a community that is not gonna be dependent on these funds. And then also the Diversity Center LGBTQ uh, Mental Health Services. So these five um, new recommended awards are modified from what we brought forward to you in um, June 7th. And I want to take a moment to recognize that the overall package in front of you is an 11% increase in what the current core um, allocation is that uh, totals $545,000 more. Uh, I also want to make sure your board is aware, um, if people have not done the math, that of the agencies being recommended for award, two thirds of them are current core providers in terms of the dollars and one third are new. So that's just so you know how the math lands. And I also wanna remind the board, though this is a shift in some agencies who are providing certain services, as we presented on June, sir, uh, on June 7th, there is an equitable distribution by geography, by age, by race, and core condition of well being. So the funding uh, in front of you does spread services around the community that we do recognize some of the agencies who are not receiving funding as a change for them. The second um, uh, slide here uh, covers the rest of the recommended actions. I wanna take a minute to talk about item two because this is new. And I wanna share with your board that this is outside, above, beyond, in addition to the actual RFP frame. We have identified a one source, one time source of funding. And I wanna take a minute to explain what it is because some questions have came forward. In county human services budgeting, um, as we shared at our budget presentation last week, 88.5% of our budget is state and federal dollars. And the 11.5% that is in our budget is general fund that your board approves every year and will hopefully approve this afternoon. When we have unexpected increases in the state revenue that we receive, which we only know as we get towards the end of a fiscal year, that relieves the pressure on the amount of general fund that we need to sort of balance our budget. So given the state economy continues to be very strong, there continues to be a lot of vehicles being pur purchased, vehicle license fees, um, a lot of um, people who are spending a lot of money in the economy still, our state revenues in the last two months have come in stronger than anticipated. So in collaboration with our county administrator who would otherwise pull that general fund back not needed as approved in our budget, we together are bringing forward this one time $500,000. I wanna underline it's one time, and that's because it's only a byproduct of what I just said. And next fiscal year, we don't know what it'll be. And the economists predict we'll be in a recession. 
So we felt it better to use this one time uh, money to bring forward a new recommendation, which as listed in the materials is a recognition of what we heard from a lot of the community based organizations that it was going to be very difficult, given we agreed to delay the applications because of the Omicron variant. It pushed these recommended awards to the very end of the fiscal year. And there are a number of agencies who've had this funding for a long time who uh, did not submit competitive applications are not being recommended awards. So put together, we recommend a three month bridge to help fund all agencies who are currently providing core services and not recommended for award to help them with their transition. I wanna recognize we submitted additional materials, which were in the in the package as 3A, because there was a question to which the answer was very reasonable. Because this $500,000 we identified is not tied to the RFP parameters, um, we as staff, um, though we have put forward this recommendation, we do not feel we need to be tying it to any particular parameters that were listed in RFP. And this is money that your board can look at and consider other options. So we put forward an additional document that outlined how that $500,000 could be purposed should your board want to. So we wanted to have a full transparent open discussion about that. I would say if your board, as you hear public comment and you begin deliberations, see these as because they are two separate budget actions, you might wanna consider having separate motions and vote on the first recommended action separate. And then this is a separate action if that is um, agreeable to your board and helpful to, to make the decisions in front of you. The third and fourth recommended actions are just sort of process that we need your approval to have both our department and the auditor controller to execute these actions quickly and before we come back to your board. That way we don't have to come back to your board to get approval to release money to start new contracts or if you approve the second action to get money, um, bridge money to the current providers, um, we can do that right away. And then the fourth one, as uh, Chair Koenig, you said in the materials, we are recommending that we return in December for a comprehensive report on everything, including any direction we get today. This last asterisk I wanna share is um, I had shared in our department budget presentation last week that your board had passed in consent a deferral of the actual core budget from last week to today so that the policy discussions and the budget could be um, discussed in one day. Um, a technical issue, the actual core budget itself is in consent this afternoon. So I just wanna share that as a matter of full transparency. And the second is it is actually the budget for the county and it includes the city budget because the city passed their budget on consent and we have an MOU which your board and the city council approved on June 7th. So just a technical issue that the full budget of city and county are on consent this afternoon. This is a very brief update on the appeals. I had said uh, with Kimberly on June 7th, that, that was step one of three, and that the, our recommendation as staff was to encourage people who were disappointed in the um, recommended awards in front of you on June 7th was to proceed with an appeal. Um, there is a letter from uh, General Service Director Michael Beaton who outlines this, but the quick summary is, 19 of the agencies that were not recommended for award did file an appeal. They were allowed to appeal on as many specific items as they wanted. And so those 19 agency appeals had 73 specific items in them. 30 of those items were deemed what's a technical issue called a protest or a statement. They weren't within the parameters of what is appealable. Things like my agency provides critical services and there will be issues and concerns amongst the people I serve. That is a statement. It's not a question about whether that statement is just or righteous. It's just not an appealable item. 43 of the items were deemed appealable within the RFP parameters, 42 of them were denied. And the one that was partially substantiated is there was a recognition in general service departments review that one of the agencies was scored in the medium range on one particular budget item, though the panelists comments in the comment sections were positive about the budget. So general service turned that to us. We raised that score to the top score, but it did not result in an aggregate score that put them that particular agency uh, into change any of the awards that were um, brought to you on June 7th. So I'm going to close the presentation with sort of talking about what is next, because I really want to create more space for your board to deliberate in the public to make comment and we're here for any questions. Immediately, pending your board's um, decisions in front of you today, if you approve um, both items, we will immediately execute the new contracts that will include three months of upfront up payment to the new providers and their new contracts while we work on the contract scope of work. 
and we will also, pending your board's approval of the recommended actions, be able to immediately execute the three-month bridge payments. And when I mean immediate, that means in county time, we turn it around and we don't have to come back to your board, but we'll start working on this as soon as possible. The second is fall of 2022. There is a tremendous amount of energy surrounding this program. Historically, when it was community programs every year's budget hearings, um, when core moved from community programs to core, um, this has been a program that brings a lot of energy and a lot of attention. And we want to immediately harness and capture all the lessons learned, all the concerns, all the things that people support and be able to come back to a public meeting in December and talk about some of the lessons learned and, and take this as far as we need to so that when we um, have in three years from now are confronted with another opportunity to do another RFP, we can harness all the lessons learned, apply what worked well, and then make edits as needed adjustments going forward. Though this says fall of 2022, that's when we'll start the public process, but we're gonna begin work immediately on building up a system and a process to engage all elected officials and all community providers and other stakeholders. And then finally, um, as is in the materials today, we are recommending you direct us to return in 2022 for a very comprehensive report on a number of items that includes, this is almost forgotten in the mix of everything being discussed, we have not come back and given you a full report on the five years of core contracts and the outcomes that just played out. We'll include that in the report. We'll give an update on the lessons learned. My, my prediction is that we will continue, will be an update and we'll have more time to go through other um, lessons learned discussions uh, in early 23. We'll provide an update on uh, the status of contracts and if you support the bridge funding. And then finally, to the additional direction we were given um, on June 7th, we will also be able to give a full report on our efforts to establish contracts that um, are agreeable to your board under that direction to make sure we have accountability measures and outcomes. I do wanna share as just one final comment. We did since that June 7th directive confirm that the contract templates that we have do uh, address accountability. I do also wanna comment that when your board approved our budget last week, and there were some public comments earlier today that included some extra staffing in our contracts unit, which will give us more resources to track accountability and outcomes in the core programs and all of our contracts. So that sort of ties together well. Um, and we will be able to um, report on sort of where we are with execution. So I'm gonna close out by again, repeating, this is of course your decision to make, but as I've been tracking the conversation, I just wanna highlight that the core budget and the recommended action one to approve the five recommended additional awards is one budget item. And you might wanna consider taking that as one motion. And the $500,000 is a different item, a different one-time source. And if that is easier for you to sort of process the two, um, that could be a separate item if that's uh, agreeable to you. So Kimberly and I are here for any questions and Chair Conant, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Director Morris and Deputy Director Peterson. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? I have a brief one, if that's that's fair, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, just please. thank you, Director Morris and Ms. Peterson, as always. Um, on the 500,000, I just want to express that I appreciate the idea of the bridge funding. I, I'm not actually supportive of the three month. I think that some of the other policy options that were presented would be better and I'd appreciate after getting public input, hearing my board members, uh, my colleagues thoughts, such as uh, the ability to fund for a year, some of these programs at 50%, for example, I think because it just would be a more targeted and more useful amount of money for programs. And, and the other thing is that I, I think that the board should take the opportunity uh, recognizing that this process was was followed, but also recognizing that we are seeing uh, some of the challenges that the process created to actually provide some direction and some guidance on, on some of the things to be reviewed in that process. I know it's gonna be a comprehensive look, but it's also useful to have the board make some specific suggestions, I believe, coming back as to what could be looked at um, I do have some thoughts that I can I can share on that. I think that that the board uh, probably ultimately would just like some greater flexibility, ultimately in the in the funding decision at the end. But I have some I did notice some some concerns um, in regards to the process that I think that I'd like to include a director Morris coming back that that also get reviewed. Um, but that that's it, Mr. Chair. Just some brief comments as an introductory. But I look forward to hearing the the public comments then when it comes back for a greater discussion for a motion. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Any other comments or questions at this time? I just have one quick question, which sure. is for the $500,000 in funding, why do we focus on their requested amount versus what they were actually funded at over the past five years? 
So uh, I'll start and Kimberly has all the materials with her to, to clarify. Um, for the staff recommended action in front of you of three months bridge funding, I'm confirming that is at their current yeah, so Supervisor Coonerty, for the staff recommendation of three months of bridge funding, it is at their current contract amount, not what they requested. We acknowledge that when we added the additional materials, we looked at um, what people applied for and the possibility of bringing forward some ideas, which was real, really following the issue of trying to spread money more around and one time giving some of these agencies an opportunity with what they requested. But there is a, a difference between those two. But Kimberly, do you want to add anything to clarify? Or Supervisor Coonerty, if that answered your or did not answer your question, please follow up with another. It answers my question, but I guess I was confused because the language says uh, it's bolded uh, of requested funding. Um, so for, just, for the additional item, the material three B the, the or A and three A, three A, policy A option yeah. one, it, it the bolded line says requested, and so I'm just trying to. Make sure we're all clear on we're all, what we're talking about. Right. So that um, that particular policy option that's uh, different from the recommended option. So in the recommendation, it it's the three month um, bridge funding is based on current levels and and uh, the organizations that we had identified. Um, and if you chose to take that. Um, you know, that dollar amount in those organizations and spread that out over more than a quarter at a, at a lower amount, um, we could do that. But to provide a different type of option, a different way of looking at it, um, these are examples of how much of what they were requested, what percentage of what they requested could be provided in different increments. So it's just a different, a different type of option. Different cut. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor Caput. So, uh, Randy and uh, Kimberly, thanks a lot. It, it's a lot of work to go through all this. And uh, I, I guess uh, if my count is right, uh, we, we were over, we only have so much money. And uh, there's a lot of, they're all great causes, and people are asking for more or less or whatever. <clears throat> I believe if you count all the umbrella agencies that are under one bigger one, there was uh, count, uh, close to over 70 uh, applications. Uh, is that correct? One, Kimberly will probably give you the exact numbers. I, I, I think one of the numbers we've been being very clear on in staff reports have been there was about three times the amount of money requested from the right. core contracts than the actual money appropriated. So it was triple the need um, in the community and we only had one third that amount. But Kimberly, if you have the exact number in front of you. 127 proposals were received. Right, okay. Yeah, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's tough because all of them are doing great work out there. And uh, whenever you're allocating money, uh, uh, you can only do so much. So uh, what I'm getting at is you were put in a very difficult position and uh, you handled it very well and uh, re uh, respect the work that you've put into this. Uh, it's not perfect, but nothing is perfect. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, and the one thing that I've noticed uh, we haven't uh, uh, talked down on some that we're not uh, funding as much or not at all. And uh, it's kind of like we're not saying one program is better than another. What we're saying is uh, we're seeing a community uh, community need in certain areas and i think overall when we look at it we're going to see that uh that we are uh, providing that community uh, need that is out there and the other i i like the uh the idea of the transition three months transition money uh that uh, five hundred thousand came from where yeah, so I tried to explain that. It's a technical and complicated issue. So our budget, the human services budget that your board approved last year, included a certain amount of county general fund 
which we need to draw state and federal money to, to run our programs. Right. The state revenues that come in, we track every month in the last two months, and we don't actually know the finals for this month, were much higher than expected. And so every year, usually it goes the other way. They're lower than expected, but they were or on, on point. They were higher than expected. So that offsets some of the general fund in the budget. That goes back to the CAO. So in communication with our CAO's office and ultimately Carlos as our CAO, we agreed that given this one time moment, it would be a good opportunity to help address some of the community uh, concerns about this transition and agencies losing funding. Yeah. And the other thing that I do like is that uh, in December, it's kind of, is that going to be kind of like a report card uh, for all the groups and uh, the money? Depending on what you mean by report card, we have a lot of process updates to share where we yeah, are. Uh, whether the money's being spent wisely and, uh, well, not not every, you know, dollar, but uh, uh, are the programs that they're promising still functioning or the new ones up and running? So let me answer that in two ways. In December, it will be a report on the five years of the core contracts that are just coming to an end now. So in that respect, if I understand your statement report card, it would be an update on sort of what money was used, how the services are delivered and a comprehensive report on the last five years of service. Looking forward, depending on whatever your board approves today, we would be giving an update on establishing the new contracts, the process in place, the accountability measures in them, but it would be too early to actually have a, you know, quote report card just a few months into the contract cycle. That would probably be after that, where we'd talk about the future contracts and what services are being provided. Fine, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Do there yeah. no other comments or questions yeah, I'll, from the, I'll, I'll, oh, sorry, Supervisor yeah, McPherson. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I was going to wait to hear from public comment, but I just want to thank uh, again the Human Services Department and all the participants in the rating panels. Uh, very difficult situation that you had. Uh, and thank you to all the organizations who supplied for core funding. Uh, 127 proposals. That's just a fraction of the nonprofit or community organizations we have in the county. It's in the hundreds, probably certainly more than 500, closer to a thousand. So. Um, it's it's a tough thing that we have, uh, the department has, the uh, rating panel had uh, to address. Uh, simply put, there's not enough uh, money to support everything we want or that it was requested. I think there was about $16 million worth of requests and we have just short of $6 million to uh, allocate. So I, I think that um, th that our staff intends to work previously funded program organizations to see if there are non-core dollars available, and I'm glad that we went to that extent. Um, and there's been a lot of work that has gone into laying the groundwork for this shift of funding that we have seen. And uh, my sense is that we're going to continue to see and uh, and uh, what could be done and learn from it and be responsive to the feedback. Um, my, my The biggest concern I've heard about in my office is the fact that no services were directly allocated to the San Ramsa Valley in the 5th District. Um, but it's also my understanding that the number of organizations recommended for funding have identified their applications that they would serve the Valley as a percentage of their client base. For instance, the United Way um, its application for cradle uh, to career, one third of that allocation is going to the San Ramsa Valley. So it's, um, you've got to look into it deeply to find out where the money is being allocated, where it's going and how it's serving. Um, I'd, I'd like our staff uh, to give more specifics about how we can assure through our contracting pro process that organizations will be successful. And I think you're going to do that in December. Uh, but overall, I, I appreciate um, um, Mr. Uh, or Supervisor Friend's uh, recommendation, but uh, it's getting late in the game and uh, that's not to the fault of his. We didn't know what was going to come up with this extra hundred uh, or five hundred thousand dollars, but I, I can support both of the options as they are presented today, um, either separately, and I think it should be separate, 
um, or to uh, a lot realign the original funding to include the capacity for bringing additional or on additional uh, organizations that were mentioned uh, and adding the new funding to support the three month bridge. Um, you're right, it's not going to go on forever, but we really have to be careful um, with a uh, recession looming if it's not upon us already, um, what we are going to be able to do next year with the funds that we have and it's going to be coming in from the state. So I, um, I would, I think it's um, really late to try to refocus how we're going to allocate that $500,000 that was mentioned. And I think the proposal by the Human Services Department is um, on target and I would be willing to support either, um, I, I, I think we should support them in a separate, separate motions. Um, that's my thoughts. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I want to open it for public comment now. I know you've all been waiting patiently, so if you have a comment to make, please approach the podium. Good morning, Chair, Supervisors, and staff. I'm Helen Yoon Story. I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Community Action Board. As you know, CAB is the county's designated community action agency charged with eliminating poverty and creating social change through advocacy and essential services. We serve over 10,000 low-income people annually, including through our youth and adult employment services and our Davenport Resource Service Center on the county's isolated North Coast. I'm also here today with my colleagues from CAPS Immigration Project and Homelessness Prevention and Intervention Services, who will speak in a little bit. We're here today to thank you and let you know that we support the adjusted recommendations for CAB's core proposals, which will support thousands of low-income people, including at-risk, at-promise youth, young adults, day workers, and farm workers, to access needed services and supports to more fully thrive in our community. We also appreciate that this is a challenging year for the county as we continue to recover from the pandemic, from the fire, um, as well as the current economic uh, situation we're in. And we know that we're facing a recession as well. However, I just wanna say we know that this is also when safety net services are needed the most, when the community is hurting. So I really do want to respectfully uh, encourage you to continue to look for additional funding to support safety net services for children, seniors, you know, mental and physical health, many of our colleagues in the community that, that provide very valuable services um, in order to keep our community strong as we weather these difficult times. Cab thanks you and we continue uh, to look forward to our continued partnership to equitably serve our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Story. Good morning, Chair, Supervisors. My name is Paz Padilla. I'm the um, Housing Prevention and Intervention Service Director for Community Action Board. We serve hundreds of income, low income and diverse homeless um, households per year, providing vital services just as, such as rental assistance to avoid eviction, homeless intervention, and stability support for vulnerable youth and young adults. We appreciate it and we support the core recommendation for CAB's housing prevention and intervention service. We understand this is a difficult year in our community and are thankful for the recommendations so that we may continue providing rental assistance to avoid eviction to uh, and prevent homelessness for our low income families, seniors, and disabled households throughout the county, including South County with our partners, California Rural Legal Assistance, Families in Transitions, PVUSD Healthy Start, and PV Shelter. Again, thank you so much for your support, your partnership, your commitment to equity in our community. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. My name is Kate Hinenkamp. I'm Operations Manager for the Community Action Board Immigration Project. And we serve at the Immigration Project over 6,000 immigrants and family members from diverse low-income households. We provide community education and immigration legal services county for people from all over the county. And we're grateful to the HSD for the core recommendation to fund CAB's Immigration Project. We know this is a difficult year, as we've just heard that there's some, some difficult decisions in front of you. And we support the recommendation of funds to our immigration project at CAB. This would allow us to launch the very first uh, nonprofit immigration services office in the city of Santa Cruz. 
And it will also allow us to expand DACA and citizenship services countywide to take advantage of $600,000 that we've been awarded by the state to, uh, for scholarships for DACA and citizenship. So this would really help your funds to go further to help folks, immigrant families in the community. Um, at the same time, we strongly encourage you to look for additional funding to support other needed services for a strong, effective safety net. Our programs are interconnected. We've been working for decades with partners like Community Bridges that helps us extend our reach. So immigration, right now we subcontract with Community Bridges for referrals to our program. And the, if program agencies like Community Bridges and others are not funded, all of our work is, is truncated, we can accomplish less. So we, we encourage you to, to continue to look for options. And we just wanna thank you once more for your support, your partnership and your commitment to equity in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hinnenkamp. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. It's a pleasure joining you today. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the Executive Director of Ventures. We're very honored to be recommended for funding for Semillitas, which is the college savings account program throughout the county that supports kids by creating a college savings account and additional contributions until they turn five. I'm also excited to say that's part of that program we're aligning with the state program that's to launch this summer. So hopefully our kids get $1,000 by the time they enter kinder for the future education. This is a huge growth and it's, it will leverage the county's investment. In addition, as a new recommended program is including our guaranteed income pilot, which we call ALAS, which we launched with the hope of trying to prove ways to enhance and support of safety net programs so that people can move out of poverty and have economic mobility. The program itself, I just got an email right now that the, the IRB process has been approved by UC Santa Cruz. So we'll be partnering with UC Santa Cruz who will pay for the evaluation of program that hopefully will give this county tools to look at and how we best leverage and work together to get people out of poverty in an equitable, sustainable way. Again, I'm thankful for the support, thankful for the efforts that have been made to continue to support the safety nets and here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Cadenas. Good morning, Supervisors. Before I start, is it possible and appropriate to provide just some letters from some community members in a district map? Sure, you're welcome. On the record, please. Thank you. Welcome so to hand those to the clerk. Good morning, Chairman Koenig, uh, Supervisors, uh, Director Morris, Nicole. I'm sorry. Um, yes, the Nicoles are on my mind today. I wonder why. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Stephen Matsey. I am the uh, Santa Cruz County Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program Coordinator, operating under Advocacy Inc., uh, which had not been recommended for funding, uh, which was very disheartening, considering the uniqueness of our program and the only provider of ombudsman services to the 1,800 beds in skilled nursing and residential care facilities in the community. However, I'm here to say thank you. Uh, thank you to Director Morris um, and to county staff for finding some money uh, to uh, recommend some bridge transition money to our program. Uh, that will certainly be helpful. Um, I do wanna remind everybody that we are still in the current pandemic. And if we've learned anything over the last two and a half years is that our older adults living in long-term care have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic and continue to suffer through lockdowns, up and down lockdowns, uh, low staffing, at facilities as historic staffing levels have been reduced because of pandemic. And as those staff members and facilities are leaving, our ombudsman, including myself, are going in, donning N95s, face shields when necessary, gloves and full PPE to protect ourselves and to protect our community members and those residents living in long-term care. So again, I, this is just a reminder to everyone here today that those folks often get overlooked because the doors are closed on those facilities. Please do not forget about them. I will be honored to come back on a regular basis to speak to you more about our program and offer an invitation to each of you to join me on a drive-by into a facility in your district to meet the residents that are your constituents. Thank you so much for the funding recommendation for the bridge transition. We do certainly appreciate that. I want to thank personally you. thank you also. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you got left out and uh, uh, that it hurt. And uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is you're one of my favorite uh, um, uh, programs that are out there helping the community. And uh, going through the whole COVID thing must have been very difficult because not only were the uh, people in the rest homes uh, 
you know, they they were they couldn't even have visitors, uh, and uh, it, it must have been very very difficult. And I want to thank you for uh, in the past uh, helping out South County. <clears throat> I went out there with Wayne Norton, and he's doing good in retirement, I guess. And uh, uh, we we had some big uh, battles down there with uh, a couple of rest homes. So uh, without an ombudsman, we wouldn't have been able to uh, fix things. Supervisor Caput, thank you so much for your support of our program and for all of the board members that are here today. And we're still fighting the good fight. We'll still do that regardless of where the funding is coming from. Thank you. I'll, I'll yeah. give you a call sometime. Maybe we'll get coffee, okay? I'd love that. Thank all you. Right. Right. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Frenzel. I am the executive director at the Diversity Center. And we're here just um, with the great privilege and honor of saying thank you for looking for ways to um, fund more organizations. We are being considered for funding in the new recommendations. And we wanted to personally show up and say thank you so much. I can't imagine the job that you've had to do. And it's been it's been something to watch. And so we really um, heartfully thank you because what we're going to be able to do is work with the crisis in the LGBTQ community around mental health. And we're also going to be able to be a strong and important partner um, with all of the organizations who meet on a monthly basis to try to address the mental health crisis within the youth. And so now we get to um, utilize these funds to support not only ourselves, but other organizations struggling with the same issue. And so we're here with some of our community just to say thank you. Thank you very much and please approve the new recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Frenzel. Good morning, my name is Larry Friedman. I've been a resident of the county for 50 years and I've lived in the unincorporated areas as well as in the city and I've been a taxpayer for over 40 years. I'm a member of the Diversity Center community. I'm a longtime volunteer. I was one of the people that started the first gay pride in Santa Cruz, 1975. I've been here fighting the good fight. And I wanna thank you all for uh, considering the Diversity Center for some funding in this next round here. There's so much need. I've been a volunteer at the front desk at the Diversity Center for years. And between old uh, seniors who are coming in or who are isolated and don't have support and youth and trans kids who are needing mental health support, it's really a, a godsend to have you supporting us. I was a social worker at Watsonville Hospital for 13 years, a social worker at Dominican Hospital for about 20 years, and the need for mental health services has never been greater throughout. So I know it's been a hard job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Hello, my name is Barb Jordan. I'm a resident of District 1, and I'm also a donor to the Diversity Center, and I brought Ruth here today to support me. Um, I want to commend county staff for really working creatively to try to adjust the recommendations in response to community input, and also to find additional money. I think that's really incredible work. Um, there are so many worthy entities here and I appreciate hearing appreciation from you about the work that all of these nonprofits are doing. But finally, I wanna urge the Board of Supervisors to act today to approve the funding for the core grant program, including the Diversity Center and also the additional $500,000. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Hello, my name is Andrea Damon. I uh, run parent groups for trans families of Santa Cruz County, and we have not applied for funding for you, but I'm here today to speak to the importance of the diversity center programs for our youth. And I'm so heartened to see that you've um, decided to include them in your grant program this year. As you know, the pandemic has taken an incredible toll on the mental health of all youth but trans and LGBTQ youth in particular. And as a group facilitator talking to parents every day, I've been a first person witness to the mental health struggles of these young people and also can attest to the really life-saving programs that they have been offered at the Diversity Center. Having the youth groups has been a lifeline for LGBTQ youth in our community. And I'm so glad that their work is being recognized and I want 
just to stand here and help you understand how valuable um, and critical it is. So thank you so much for including them in your revised um, uh, proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Damon. I just wanted to uh, express gratitude for the um, Mountain Resource Center and what it's done for me. I was illegally evicted during COVID. In other words, I paid taxes for law enforcement to come out and break their own laws. And uh, so not everybody who goes homeless is uh, with the stereotype deserving it or have brought it on themselves. You mentioned veterans earlier, people mentioned people with mental health problems and that sort of thing. And uh, so I feel like the it's necessary and helpful. And uh, I just wanted to say that I was thankful for what they've done for me, and I hope that they're able to continue. Thank you. My name is Corey. I'm an advocate at Mountain Community Resources, and um, I've worked with Jim, and uh, he actually was and still is working at Safeway and I'm using our, our showers and laundry and um, and has transferred back and forth from different locations, still able to use our services, still needing assistance to try to find um, housing in the Watsonville area now. Um, so using more than one of our centers. Um, I have a question for Bruce. Um, for the Cradle to Career program, uh, does that include um, any help for the homeless? Um, and and that's a huge question because we built these showers, you know, from Housing Matters monies um, years ago, right during the CZU fires. So we have these showers and laundry that are going to go empty. Um, I would support a 50% one year um, rather than the bridge funding so that we could at least try to find a way to continue that service and not have wasted services. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. Hola, mi nombre es Sandra Rodelo y there is no translator today. Sorry. No, my name is Sandra Rodel. My name is Sandra Rodel. I just wanted to share uh, some of the art that my that my clients had uh, bring uh, through these years, and it is heartwarming. My clients have grown uh, with my parenting classes through through the years I have been there. And they come with a lot of issues like any other agency. Uh, I, I do thank you for um, finding additional um, funding, but I do hope that you keep continue looking because as you see, uh, I just not serve um, now the one a child or a member of the community, I serve the whole family and they do appreciate and uh, with words, with actions, uh, they leave those for me to remember them. And when I see them in the community, they say, thank you for transforming my life. Again, thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Myra. I'm here in representation of Community Bridges Family Resource Centers. I work as an advocate and I just want to support additional funding to be relocated to these centers. Since we do have four centers across the county that are serving a wide range of individuals of different ages, backgrounds, and different services. And I think it's highly important that we kind of look that these are evidence-based funding, funding recommendations. So we have to look at the prospective sp statistics that will come up when these service when these centers are closed and reduced hours are being um are being created. Um, there are currently long lines at our Watsonville Center, which serves a lot of vulnerable people a lot of vulnerable families specifically those that work in the fields and it is highly important that we kind of provide a lot of funding for these families since we have the count the human services agency right across the street yet we still see a wide range of individuals 
come and look for assistance for their disability, for the un, um, unemployment, and for the CalFresh. And it's really critical to look at that statistics of like our wide range of impact and our outcomes, because then that kind of shows you that there is a reason why a lot of individuals are seeking our services and we do not discriminate and we do not and we provide a whole range, um, something as simple as, you know, providing a charging station, making a phone call. And we really have to, you know, look outside of our neighborhoods and outside of our perspectives and see that just because it's not a need that we need or that we see around our community, it does not mean that other people in the outskirts of our towns are not needing these services. So any additional funds would be great because it provides a little bit of a safety net while these people help um, try to find something else in the meanwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers that wishes to address us on this item, is there anyone on Zoom? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers on Zoom. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. <laughs> Marilyn Garrett and Santa Cruz County is not alone in this uh, misery and war on the poor. A book that puts this in a framework is titled The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health. This is part of a global war on democracy and public health. And listening to people who are doing vital work for the community, who are being made more poor by these cuts, shows the county's misdirection in priorities. While millions of dollars literally go to wireless microwave 4G, 5G technology, people are going hungry and being harmed at the same time. This title here, Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Core Investments. What are the results? And looking more deeply into where the money is misappropriated in this county, like for Verizon, Cruz IO, all that. It's all backwards. And as a retired teacher of 30 years, I think of that bumper sticker, it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and we could add social services. And the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. This is all backwards. We're fighting over crumbs left after approximately half our tax dollars. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. LS, your microphone is now available. Thank you, Leah Samuels, Executive Director of the Human Care Alliance. Thank you for the amended recommendations. Having a response to these public comments in the form of action really helps move forward to collaborate and meet our shared goal of an equitable Santa Cruz. Some nonprofits now have time to get their bearings as we go to the next phase of this work. Despite the release of additional information, and I thank you, Randy, for that, um, there's still a feeling we need more information to sort what happened. There's some trust that needs to be rebuilt, and even some funded organizations have reached out with concerns. HCA proposes that you officially authorize HCA to partner with Randy Morris and his work leading up to December. Mr. Morris has been generous with his time and I can't speak for him, but my impression is our conversations have been mutually beneficial. Please also include in direction to staff they consider nonprofits that have not previously been funded, for instance, in considering ways nonprofits can get specific contracts outside of CORE. Those previously um, not funded, mostly smaller, should have the same opportunity and details. HCA accepts all nonprofits that educate or provide services in Santa Cruz. We make membership accessible regardless of the size of agency. Current membership represents a meaningful number of large nonprofits and a fairly balanced cross-section of provider categories. 
I hope you allow me to use that access that I have not only to members, but beyond to be an official part of the process. More can be done, but we can't get into the details now. As a working mom, even as I speak, I've got two young children at home. So the hit to childcare um, is particularly painful and a disruption to my career opportunities. Uh, both nonprofits and government have work to do. Personally, I feel I failed my members in a way not being involved throughout this process more. It was largely due to us not having funding for more work uh, and more help. It's hard for me to see this play out and not wonder if I could do more. I hope you'll seriously consider our offer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samuels. David, your microphone is now available. Okay, this is Bianchi, um, Executive Director for Family Service Agency. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Um, I appreciate the additional funding uh, for those that are not scheduled uh, to receive funding, but that have been funded. Um, I think, I do believe based on my 35 years of doing this process that this particular version had some serious flaws, but that everybody involved had the best intentions. It used to be um, for many years, the county staff would take the time to visit and audit our programs and in, in order to uh, know and understand them. Um, that doesn't create bias. That's just the foundation for any good relationship. Um, I am uh, obviously disappointed that five of our programs that were contained in uh, one application uh, will go unfunded. Those programs are the result of four smaller agencies merging with us, which was a long held community goal to provide services in the most efficient and cost effective way possible. Um, I don't believe that we failed this test. I think the test failed us in the community. And I don't think our panel was able to process our proposal with multiple mental health programs and services that shared common objectives and outcomes. I also don't think that disenfranchising the over 400 clients, including family, children, and seniors in counseling and women with cancer, survivors of child sexual abuse, uh, and care facility residents uh, advances the stated cause of equity that this process um, represented. So I hope you will take um, the time to look for additional resources uh, and support us in whatever way you can as we try to figure out the future uh, on how to serve the needs of these clients that had been served for decades um, with county and city support. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Search, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, Board of Supervisors. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the Executive Director of the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. We were one of the new agencies to make our first application and appeal for core funding. We were not selected for funding, but we appreciate the integrity and sincerity of county staff in the creation and management of this process. For future iterations, we look forward to collaboration to use lessons learned to improve this process. For where to go from here, we would like to state our appreciation for Mr. Morris's fourth recommendation. Each of the nonprofits works hard to diversify their revenue streams. As Mr. Morris is re referring, there are other funds which county departments have access to. Departments make contracts with nonprofits for needed services. Departments co-sign grant applications with nonprofits. And departments seek grants which they do not apply but would, could suggest... Like, <clears throat> could suggest nonprofit supply. We simply ask that the Board of Supervisors include in its direction to staff to include those nonprofits not recommended for funding who have not previously been funded by CORE. Mr. Morris's recommendation is a momentous step towards officially collaborating between the county and local nonprofits to find to finding opportunities to meet the goals of our county departments as well as supporting our local nonprofits. Our ask is a is for a modification of recommendation number four to both include the Human Care Alliance in exploring other funding sources and to include all agencies who did not receive core 22-23 funding, regardless of whether or not they previously received core funding. 
We also ask that if the $500,000 is not used for three-month bridge funding, as mentioned in Supervisor Friend's comments, that the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz is considered for some funding so that we can provide the needed service to support the healing of both house and unhouse partner participants dealing with mental health, substance use, domestic violence, justice involvement, previously foster youth, and the LGBT community. Thank you for Thank your you, time. Sir. Allison, your microphone is now available. Thank you um, and good afternoon, supervisors and fellow community members. My name is Allison Guevara. I'm the director of Cradle to Career Santa Cruz County. I'm a social impact consultant and mom of three children. And I just want to thank you again for your recommendation to invest in Cradle to Career's expansion. Um, we're really excited to be growing into several additional communities outside of Live Oak. Um, I, you know, I feel that we've heard from several folks today just talking about the needs specifically, for example, in area, underserved areas like in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and leading up to our application, we did talk to Superintendent Chris Shiremeyer um, about the needs that he sees showing up at their schools every day. Um, there are 100 families that are still um, living in trailers um, or housing insecure as a result of the CZU fires. Um, and that has uh, implications for how the children show up at school and impact learning for everybody within that school community. And Cradle to Career is going to be able to strengthen the relationships uh, with those families, identify their needs, and link, to, link them to vital services um, in a much stronger way. Um, but of course, we don't do that in a vacuum. And I really appreciate the, the deep thinking um, and the, the deep care that I'm hearing from everybody today to really look holistically at our community's needs and services. And Cradle to Career is really committed to helping be part of addressing the root causes of adversity um, and working together to, to deliver more sustainable, robust solutions um, so that every child and every family can thrive. So again, I want to really thank you for your investment, for your, your hard uh, thinking and planning around this, um, and really excited for, to see all that we are going to accomplish together over the next three years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guevara. We have no additional speakers for this item, Chair. All right, thank you. Then I'll return it to the board for deliberation and action. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor McPherson. I, uh, I appreciate that uh, comment from about uh, United Way's career to career. I think it's open to everyone. Um, and I, I just want to assure everyone here that the, the Human Services Department and our Health Services Agency are searching for funds all the time. Uh, we're very open to it. We're a very aggressive board of supervisors to see and what is available to have to direct them to see what's available and to go after it, which we have done successfully in this situation. So I, I just want to assure everyone we're not giving up this money that we're talking about is our general uh, fund money for the county, uh, which we increased by a million dollars, what, three years ago or so. So um, we would like to give more. Um, and I hope that we can in the future, but I just want to assure everyone that we are searching our departments, the two major departments, uh, the human services and health services agencies are continually seeking funding for these types of human service programs. Um, with that, I, I would, uh, as I said, um, uh, I appreciate and, uh, Supervisor Friend's suggestion, but I'm not sure how that would you know, we, we've got to put this, if we're going to have this bridge, we've got to let them know if they're going to have it or not, or we're going to have to make a decision or would have to, I think today on some other programs. <laughs> but I, I, so I, um, I, as I said, I support the options that have been presented. I think they're very uh, well thought out and as fair as can be expected under the circumstances. And so I would be, um, I think that we should uh, have these in two separate motion uh, first, to realign the original funding to include uh, the capacity to bring on additional organizations. And uh, maybe I should just make that one um, motion and uh, then go to the second one for uh, the funding of the three month bridge for the others. So I would make the motion to, um, to uh, uh, follow the recommendation of the Human Services Agency to realign, realign the funding for the include the capacity for bringing on the additional organizations. So this is recommended action one. Correct. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a point of clarification. We have multiple 
recommendation number one. So under the, the board agenda packet, there's four, a set of four recommended actions. One of them is listed as number one. And then sub to that is what Supervisor McPherson is referring to, which are additional recommended actions, number one. And so I just think that we need to get a point of clarification of what the board is actually being asked to do right now, because I think there's some just kind of clerical recommendations under the set of the original four that maybe can be folded into this. The, the ultimate discussion here is on the 500,000 funding as well as additional direction on the um, the report back. That's where I think that there needs to be greater debate, not on the thing that uh, Supervisor McPherson's referring to. But I don't think that, I actually don't think he's moving the correct recommendation. So I just wanna make sure we're, we're totally clear on where we are on this. Well, to clarify, I mean, and maybe I should, uh, uh, Mr. Morris will, will uh, to uh, reduce the allocations for those who were funded uh, from uh, the 3% reduction to 10% to allow for the new agencies that are listed here in the large tier and medium tier to get the uh, the funding that is requested under this uh, recommendation one. That's my motion. Is, and I, I think I'm making it correctly. And uh, so it covers those that were in the original uh, allocation reduced by 10%, but adding these other uh, five that have been recommended for funding. So I will share with you what I believe is under discussion and certainly welcome council to help if there's a technical issue I'm not tracking here. Um, to Supervisor Friend's point, the published materials, the actual memo itself, recommended action number one is the modified um, awards that we've brought forward, the five additional within the confines of the RFP. And in looking at the recommend actions, number three actually bundles with it. Because if you approve the recommended awards within the RFP process, the additional five, recommend action three also then authorizes the auditor controller and HSD to immediately execute the, that package of contracts. So that could be one action. I would recommend keeping two and four separate because four, if you give di additional direction to us, what you want to make sure we look into, there was some public comment asking us to look into things. I think you could leave two and four separate based on where your deliberations go and make sure in number four, we do whatever you direct us to do in the lessons learned and the report back in December. So that's the way I'm tracking it. One and three first, two and four second. Council, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, but that's the way I read this. Supervisor friend, yes, there was additional materials that had ones and twos in them, but those will get covered under the formal Correct. recommendation action number two. And I'm supportive of that, Supervisor McPherson. If it's item one and three under recommended actions, then, then I'll second that motion. Great, thank you. Okay, then we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson and a second by Supervisor Friend uh, to adopt recommended actions one and three on the agenda memo. Any further discussion? Yes, this yes, will, this, first we're going to have another one probably. I'm right, sure. right. Is in regards to the five hundred thousand dollar bridge funding. Uh, one four. Uh, I'm. I'm happy to. I'm happy to read it for you, Supervisor Caput. Correct. So the uh, the first motion here is to approve recommended actions one and three from our agenda packet. Uh, recommended action one is to approve fiscal year 22-23 collective of results and evidence-based investments request for proposals, final recommended awards in attachment one, which include adjust proposed adjustments to those outlined to the board on June 7th, 2022 and delegate authority of the human services department to execute agreements of all final recommended awards prior to September 30th, 2022. And then the, the other, uh, no, no, I, uh, <laughs> I am reading it from the agenda here. <laughs> all right, any further discussion? Seeing non clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Yeah, aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Recommended actions one and three pass unanimously. All right, thank you. Then we'll continue discussion on items two and four. Supervisor Friend? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for that. So my, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page with what I was actually proposing. What I'm proposing is an option that's before us. It's not, uh, I'm not uh, trying to do something that hasn't been transparently presented. Under the attachments, the, one of the options is policy option two, which is to fund additional proposals by the RFK, RFP rankings. That's to take $500,000 
and break it up uh, uh, over various ways. The way that I would recommend is, is what's being proposed right in front of us, which is over one year to take the 500,000 and to fund it uh, at 50% funding for the next ranked eight medium and one small, which would be just to read it, uh, would be the hospice of Santa Cruz County, New Life for the Gemma House, the Parent Center, the Senior Citizens Organization of the San Lorenzo Valley, the Mentors Program, PVPSA, Elder Day from Community Bridges, and then the Faith Community Shelter Program with the Association of Faith Communities. And then the small tier would be the Senior Council uh, Project Scout Program. So that was my, what I was recommending, as opposed to just doing a three-month transition funding, doing something more meaningful, which is under our options that are being presented to provide an entire uh, half uh, funding for these programs that were in order of their rankings. Now, there, there are other options that are presented under those policies, but that's that was what I was recommending doing. I just wanted to make sure you, you had made a statement of, of that this, in essence, that wasn't a policy option that was before us. And I want to be clear that this is something that's, that's being presented as an option. I'm just choosing a different option than just a three-month bridge funding, providing a more meaningful 12 months of those programs. Is that a motion? Um, I, I'm okay with continuing to have a dialogue before I have a motion gets sure. thrown down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But I wanted to hear Supervisor McPherson's thoughts. I think it's really important the board be united on, on this issue. I mean, I'm not opposed to three-month transition funding. I just think this is a more meaningful investment. If the board majority feels that uh, the three-month transition funding is, is, more, uh, is, is a better way to do it, I, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just making a policy decision that I think um, uh, that, that I think the 50% for that number is better. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. I'd like, to, I, I appreciate your, your uh, recommendation. Um, and I think I, I could get behind it. I'm just trying to get a, a sense of what it really means and how much to whom, I guess. Um, I, I mean, obviously, uh, Supervisor Friend has those targeted. He has certainly not talked to me about those that he has brought up today, and that's proper. Maybe he has with one other board member, but uh, I just would like to get a sense of who is involved again. Uh, Supervisor Friend did mention it. Uh, I, I think there's some um, legitimate uh, reasoning for following that. I mean, it just it, it reestablishes or continues to establish those that I think are six agencies that he mentioned, but um, I, um, I, um, I know that the others that for continuing for three months that some of the, who were not getting the funding they wanted, they said, okay, we can at least go with a three month extension. So um, well, it's one of those decisions we're just going to have to make. Um, can you just reiterate what, what those agencies were and how much is involved. Yeah, I mean, we're talking Supervisor McPherson, this, this is attachment three B. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not picking and choosing organizations. Oh, I see. Okay. This is, this is outlined by uh, the human services department as the next highly ranked sets of agencies. So under the medium tier, if you fund it for 50% for one year, that would be the first eight agencies. And for the small tier, that would be the first agency. That That's just, that's how those agencies okay. came about. So that's, that is attachment three B. Okay. Did you, Ms. Morris, could you just comment that you know, you've been in this discussion with everybody? Uh, and so um, I just want to get your sense of where, where would we be going with this? Yeah, and let me offer some full disclosure about the sequence of events. Um, when we really late, as we were finishing publishing the materials, we literally the last day or two came up with this $500,000 for the reasons I described. So the first action was to respond to what we had been hearing from community providers about this transition is really rushed and some form of transition funding would help. So that was what was published. I just want to make sure for those who don't track this level of technical detail, we then submitted additional materials. So that's what came up as 3A. The reason we did that is literally we got the materials done at the very end and added that $500,000 reference. We immediately realized that because that $500,000 is not part of the RFP parameters, it's going to raise questions about, well, what else? So our staff recommendation remains three months of bridge funding. It was directly in response to community provider feedbacks about their concern about not having a bridge. But this is $500,000 that could be 
used differently. So then we submitted attachment 3A, which gave a few policy options. So they are very different policy options. And as is the whole core discussion, it's not an enough. We wish we had enough to do all of them. So we just have different options in front of you. One is the bridge funding. That's our recommendation. Then to your question, Supervisor Mary Pearson, we broke down a few ways of sort of slicing and dicing and taking that 500,000 to do some different things. What Supervisor Friend is then referring to is what's attachment 3B. And I think due to the timing, it didn't actually get published in the materials, but is in the public record. So what all board members have is then the ranking list that you have in front of you of who was the next in rank. If that's the policy choice you choose, you would be saying, let's not give everybody three months of funding. Let's instead go with those next ranked in that document 3B. I'm going to use that frame to turn it over to Kimberly and she can repeat if supervisor friend, you can clarify the exact option in front of you, then Kimberly can read the names of those organizations from the three B document for the public to hear. Yeah. So if you please, when you go to next rank order, just down the line, because I, I've got three B. So was, for, go ahead, uh, Ms. Peterson, go ahead. I'm apologize. Oh, no, it's okay. So for the option that would be 50% funding for one year, that would um, cover access um, for um, hospice of Santa Cruz County, access um, to end of life care for all, new life community services, Gemma House, uh, the parent center, their parent center program, senior citizens organization of San Lorenzo, um, their senior citizens program, uh, mentors driving for change, uh, two generation service to strengthen relationships, um, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, Community Bridges Elder Day, um, uh, and uh, Association of Faith Communities um, of Santa Cruz and Project Scout, which is with the Seniors Council. So I, I just want to say I appreciate that you took the first action because that sort of closes that budget. This is a different one-time budget, one time only, the money we have and the two choices in front of you are very different. Taking that 500,000 for a three month bridge or taking that 500,000 for one year of partial funding to the providers that Kimberly listed, two very different policy choices. Right, so uh, I can be acceptable to that. Um, the, um, but with the knowledge that it may not be there next year. Uh, uh, well, I, I think it, I, I have to say as a human services department director with every economist prediction of a recession coming and our budget so dependent on federal and state funding, um, I, I think the community deserves transparency that this is for sure one-time funding because the state economy is strong. And if the state economy turns the way it's supposed to, that particular funding stream is very likely not going to be here. We would have to do what you said earlier, Supervisor McPherson, look for other grants, other opportunities. I don't think general fund is likely to be there. I just don't want to mislead the community to think that this would go beyond one year. Supervisor Kennedy, did you want to weigh in? Sure. Uh, so uh, let me just say, I mean, I think I agree with I agree with Supervisor Friend that it's important that that we move forward collectively uh on this and it's you know as as everyone said there's there's too much need and too many organizations doing good work and too little fund and we're going to continue to work to find that funding i as as director morris mentioned there's really sort of two different policy objectives here right there's the policy objective of the recommended action which basically gives people a little bit of a softer landing uh, during this transition for those who got no funding. And then there's what a uh, supervisor uh, friend is recommending, which is uh, the other policy option, which basically says, look, we just, let's give half a year funding to these organizations that rank the highest. Some of them are new. Some of them are ones who lost funding. Um, and let's have a bigger impact rather than sort of spreading the the peanut butter uh, extra thin. I, um, I'd i humbly propose us what I think is a middle ground uh, here, but I want to see what folks think, which is um, that we fund those who got, those who were funded for the last five years, but who did not get funding, but we fund agencies um, who receive grants over $25,000 uh, last year, because I think Sending folks um, a check for twelve hundred dollars or fifteen hundred dollars um, in the in the large scheme of things doesn't won't make a substantive difference. And I'm I'm sympathetic to what Supervisor Friend is driving at here, which is I'd rather make a more substantive investment and help people move forward. So the idea being that let's let's provide a cushion 
uh, for folks who who had funding in the past and who are not getting it, but that let's have that floor so that um, we have more dollars to spend among organizations that, that are basically seeing a bigger cut in their budget. Um, I'm not going to make a motion because I do. I want to hear my colleagues, and I, I'm open to to whatever direction folks want to head. But uh, but that was my suggestion to sort of hopefully meld a little bit of the two goals, policy goals that people are talking about in this case. So to be clear, Supervisor Kennedy, you're you're suggesting uh, funding organizations that previously received funding. Oh, sorry, over twenty five thousand dollars. What was the? It's the, it's the recommended action from uh -huh. the human, from the Human Services Department, but setting a floor of uh, we only uh, provide bridge funding to organizations that that receive more than twenty five thousand dollars last year. And with the idea being that that would allow us to provide more fund, more bridge funding to those that are above that level. Yeah, and who are taking bigger hits. You know, taking a sixty thousand dollar hit is a lot bigger than taking a twelve thousand dollar hit. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Morris, do you want to comment at all on how that? I, I have a map? well, I have a point of clarification for Supervisor Coonerty. Um this is very complicated, so bear with me as I make sure I'm very, very clear so that we can execute if this ends up being part of the direction. There's actually two adjustments to what I'm hearing, Supervisor Cooney, I want to confirm I heard it. So one is to sort of create a only above X amount of dollars because it's too small amount and that gives a little more to spread around. But I want to confirm the second. In the item um, 3A, which is not the bridge funding, it includes everybody who applied for funding not just those who are current recipients of funding. So I just want to confirm if you're also recommending to remove any applicant for funding who's not currently a core recipient, because if so, that would end up actually pulling more money to spread. And my final comment is wherever you go today, I hope we can take some time at the end to get very clear policy direction. We will not have the numbers today. We will not have the exact names today, but we can absolutely execute the policy direction. I just want to be realistic. What, there's some things are in front of you. We know what it is. If you choose to go this route, we we can execute the direction, but we won't be able to tell you what exactly that lands because we have to go do that math. Yeah, but Supervisor so, Cooney, is that what did I hear you correctly? Just to be both? clear, yeah, my my idea for this five hundred thousand dollars is that we've had agencies who have been funded for five years and in many cases longer. They weren't recommended for funding uh, under this new core process. I think as a matter of public policy, we want to give people cushion and time to adjust and change their or, or partner or do whatever find other sources of funding do whatever they need to do to to, <clears throat> to adjust this reality and so it would be funding programs that were funded uh last year over twenty five thousand dollars that applied for funding and uh that we would provide a bridge cushion based on their funding from last year of whatever for of however long we possibly could based on the amount of money that's left and the number of agencies okay that's clear thank you yeah i'll, I'll just say I don't, I don't know that shifts the calculus all that much i can't imagine there's a whole lot of programs under $25,000 and, you know, and given the size of the other ones, I mean, well, maybe we're talking about another half month, month for. I, I think if I'm following um, supervisor friend's proposal of going with the option listed in attachment three A and then three B list the agencies at 50% for one year. If you add supervisor Coonerty's comment, I think you would pull a little extra money on two fronts. One, you would not be funding agencies below, I forget the number, 20 or 25,000 supervisor community. But number two, I'm hearing supervisor community, you're then pulling funding to agencies that are new applicants. If I have that both, then we could do that math. And it would mean instead of 50% funding, it would go up a certain amount of percentage point. So all the current providers that were next ranked would get one year of something more than 50%. That's what I'm tracking. And I think Kimberly wants to clarify or and or give some details. I think they're talking about uh, I think 
as mm -hmm. I'm understanding, is this conversation about actually our recommendation, but modifying our recommendation? That's correct, Ms. Peterson. These are two very distinct things, oh. Director Morris. Supervisor Coonerty is proposing accepting the staff recommendation, but just modifying it to not include organizations that received less than 25000 in funding. So it's, it's three-month bridge funding or potentially longer for the remaining organizations. Yeah. Uh, and then my proposal is, is, to, is on policy option two. Um, I'm not opposed to um, Supervisor Coonerty's proposal. I mean, I think that I hear what he's trying to get at. My, my main my main argument here is that that the, is is whether the three months was substantive, whether it really provided meaningful input versus the the more legitimate investment, which is why most of that money is going toward medium tier, eight of the nine organizations that are being funded, which would be over fifty thousand. Um, so, uh, but but again, I, I think it's important that the board um, be really unified on this one, and and so if that's that's the direction the board wants to go, I'd be supportive of that as well, um, Mr. Chair. I'll, I mean, I know you haven't weighed in on it yet, but I could go either way on this, just as I heard Supervisor McPherson could. Um, I don't think that there's a perfect answer to any of this. Uh, I, I just think that what I'm trying to come up with is 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 the best answer in an, an ideal situation for these organizations. And, and with that clarification, then Supervisor Koenig, I can answer your question more clearly. Thank you, Kimberly. I was conflating the two. Then we would do an analysis and it might go up th to three and a half months or maybe four, depending on how that math lands. But that, that, if I heard that correct, we wouldn't be able to do the math now unless our staff texts Kimberly with an answer because there's people listening. But but we would do the math and apply the direction and then we could give a report back on where it landed later. Do, do you have an idea? I mean, uh, we're going to be off in July. Would you be able to do it by the first week in August? Tell us what we're what we're doing. <laughs> Uh, um, I, th I think depending on your direction, um, what would be realistic would be um, a consent item somewhere, just kind of listing what happened, if that would be agreeable to make sure that yeah. circles back, because I understand December is a, a far way out versus because we spend a lot of time and energy getting reports together. But if that would be agreeable, I think just giving a like a written materials back to you at some time with kind of where, depending on what direction you give us, kind of where we're going, and then we could give a more detailed regular report at the December would be would be practical for us. Sure. Thank but, you. And to be clear, Supervisor McPherson, neither, the, neither of these actions delays funding to these organizations. I mean, it's either bridge funding. We're providing the authority to the Human Services Department to do this now. I mean, they would they would be either providing the bridge funding for those over 25,000 or, or we would be funding these eight medium and one small now for 50% for a year. So the only thing that they'd be coming back with is just a list of the organizations. Yeah, thank you. You know, I'll I'll weigh in on this as well. I mean, I, I don't have a strong preference one way or another. I think that there are merits to both of these proposals. I mean, on the one hand, um, we're able to make a more substantive difference for the nine programs, eight medium, one small, uh, that are next in line to receive funding. That honors the process and is makes a larger impact for the organizations that are funded. Uh, and on the other, I mean, it's June twenty eighth, and um, you know, we could be talking about these organizations losing their funding within the next few days. Um, that's pretty extreme. And I think as much as possible, we should be letting people down easy and, um, you know, recognizing that many, you know, five years that they've had funding, all that good work that they've contributed um, and uh, trying to make the transition as, as smooth as possible. And I, I believe that recommendation actually came uh, in part from the nonprofit community um, as a, as a way to facilitate the transition. So, I mean, I guess I do lean a little bit towards um, the latter, given that uh, it just helps, just helps with this transition process. And ultimately, I think, um, you know, it will be a soft landing for what has been a, a, a difficult, you know, difficult decision making process for uh, this entire funding package. Mr. Chair, then I'd be prepared then to make a motion, which would be to uh, move Supervisor Coonerty's recommendation, which is bridge funding for organizations that received greater than 25,000 in funding for the 500,000 and delegating all necessary responsibility to the Human Services Department to effectuate that, um, that bridge funding. And then on option four, um, which was recommended option four in regards to the report back, I'm just bringing up the, uh, the item language real quick so I can have some additional direction. Uh, to direct the Human Services Department to return on, on or before December 13th with an update on the transition funding uh, and the newly established contracts and performance tracking mechanisms and efforts to explore other funding mechanisms. 
um, for agencies not being recommended for award and progress on the lessons learned. As part of the lessons learned, uh, I would just like some uh, review on whether we should continue uh, funding um, school districts, whether we, we have a, an out of town funding situation, whether we should continue to fund out of town, whether we should continue to allow self attestation of the nonprofits, which may have miscategorized some of them, which made it harder for some of them to compete for funding. To take a greater look at those that use leverage funding and how that's ranked. And then lastly, I'd like to create a flexibility option, which is I think that a lot of this would have been obviated if say 75% of the core funding was allocated directly associated to the ranking process, but another 25% were set aside where the board would have flexibility uh, to review those that had applied but not received funding or those that received funding but it wasn't full funding to make a decision at that time with the 25% held back for greater flexibility. So it's just providing direction. This is not, this is to, just to come back in December with these additional things to be part of the analysis of lessons learned. I think that some of these were some of the flaws that we saw within the process. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, can I just motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty, uh, Supervisor McPherson. I just want to make it just to clarify this. We're just talking about the five hundred thousand dollars that that's clear because we had the other motion, right? Um, there is. I'm hearing the only the five hundred thousand, right? Which is two, and then Supervisor Friend just added some specificity to item four, which is to make sure when we do the lessons learned, we include everything he listed, which we can do in the lessons learned process. Good, that's correct. Right. And, and to be clear, the uh, item two is modified as recommended by Supervisor Coonerty uh, to only be for organizations that receive $25,000 or more in 21, 22. Good luck. Any further discussion? I don't know. Uh, Supervisor Cabot? So, uh, uh, Randy and uh, Kimberly, uh, the motion is what by uh, Supervisor Friend, seconded by Coonerty? Correct, yes. Okay. And are we unraveling anything? No. Your acceptance of what I admit was my recommendation to do items one and three together, that is where unraveling could have happened if you went against the recommended rankings in the RFP within the RFP um, budget. So that's been passed now unanimously. So what we're talking about now is just a policy decision of your board A how to spend the 500,000. We have clear direction and the motion makes sense. B, to make sure when we do the lessons learned process and report back that we include everything supervisor friend listed, which we will interview board members and we'll talk to community partners. There's a public comment about working with CBOs. Of course, we will do that, get their feedback on parameters. So all of that makes sense and we can execute on, on the motion that's on the table. And, and we have the money. Yes. The money all balances out. Okay, thank you. All right, well, if there's no further discussion, then clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. Recommended actions two and four, passed unanimously as amended. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we do have a number of other items on our regular agenda, but we have been going for about three and a half hours. What I'd recommend is uh, that we take uh, a lunch break now until about one o'clock, come back, uh, try to finish the remaining items on our regular agenda, and then move right into budget hearings at 1.30. If that's amenable to everyone, then we'll uh, the board will recess now. Thank you. All right, we will resume the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and uh, we'll begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, and for the record, it is 1.01 p.m. We will uh, proceed with item 10, a public hearing to consider the approval of revenue notes by the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority in order to provide interim financing for the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District purchase of certain assets at the Watsonville Community Hospital, adopt resolution providing for the issuance and sale of a 22-23 grant anticipation note in an amount not exceeding $30 million, approving a fiscal agent agreement, 
local obligation note purchase agreement and placement agent agreement and authorizing certain other matters related thereto and take related actions outlined in the memorandum of the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. For a report on this item, we have our auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector, Ms. Edith Driscoll. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Good members afternoon. of the board. The item before you today outlines the proposed funding and attached documents required for the issuance of a revenue note in order to provide interim financing for the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District, their purchase of certain assets of the Watsonville Hospital Community Hospital, Watsonville Community Hospital. Approval of the interim financing in the form of revenue notes requires adoption of resolutions by the Board of Supervisors and by the Authority Board after the Board of Supervisors conducts a public hearing. As background, the county and other community stakeholders have been instrumental in the formation of the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District. The county has been working diligently with members of the state legislature to obtain grant funding from the state for a portion of the purchase of certain assets of the Watsonville Community Hospital. The documents here reflect the words up to 30 million, although uh, it appears as of now we will be looking at getting 25 million from the state. After acquisition of the assets, the hospital will be operated by the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District Hospital Corporation. <coughs> I am here today along with Suzanne Harold, the municipal advisor who will explain the funding structure in a, more, in a moment, uh, giving you more details. These items are on your agenda today as time is of the essence for funding the purchase of the hospital. The deadline for purchase has been set by the bankruptcy court as August 31st, 2022. And although we are very appreciative of the state funding, it is not anticipated to be received in time to meet the court mandated deadline of August 31st. The county has proposed to provide interim financing, interim funding to Pajaro Valley Hospital by August 31st, 21-22 to be reimbursed when the grant is actually received from the state. I will now ask Suzanne Harold to provide more detail on this financing item and she'll do so via Zoom. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, I know you have a lot on your agenda today, so we'll quickly move through uh, the presentation. Um, as uh, Mr. Stoll mentioned, um, the Paro Valley Healthcare District has raised about $25 million to purchase the hospital out of the bankruptcy. And the state uh, in their recent budget uh, bill has provided $25 million uh, in grant funding to assist for the hospital purchase. And um, the state budget includes uh, actually two line items for this grant um, expected to be signed by the governor by June 30th. Next slide. Um, as Ms. Driscoll mentioned, the bankruptcy court has set August 31 as the deadline and unfortunately, the grant funding will probably not be received until October by the time they process uh, all the paperwork up at the state level. And so the, this county grant anticipation note will provide the interim funding between the acquisition date sometime in August and the receipt of the grant sometime in October. Next slide. Uh, the note structure is for the financing, the county's financing authority to issue a revenue note, which will be sold to an investor. The financing authority will take the funding that it receives and purchase the county's grant anticipation note and the county uh, grant anticipation note proceeds will be held until the hospital escrow closing. Um, as in other financings the county has participated in, the county's financing authority was formed to assist in county financing such as this. And then once the uh, grant funding is received, the county note and the financing authority note will be redeemed or prepaid you know, at, at the earliest possible date. So the recommendation um, by the Board of Supervisors is to conduct the public hearing and receive testimony, um, adopt the resolution approving the issuance of the county note in the form of documents and authorize the payment of costs and, and interest on the note and for the Financing Authority Board of Directors to adopt the resolution approving the issuance of the revenue note and the form of the various documents. And that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you to both of you. Are there any questions from members of the board? Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. First, uh, great appreciation to our state legislative delegation for the securing of the funding. Um, also to Ms. Harrell and also our wonderful auditor controller, treasurer, tax collector for all of your work on this process. This is an essential thing. We have to do this in order to ensure that this that the hospital has stood up. And uh, we have repeatedly said as a board that this is an equity issue uh, that we are going to lead on. And uh, this is, a, I mean, realistically, this is a very, very, very minimal risk uh, deal for the county, considering the fact that we've got the state funding coming to back end. It is just really a timing issue. So I just want to appreciate how much the, What's being presented here goes by quickly, but there was a massive amount of work done by the county team in order to make this possible. So just appreciation uh, to everybody involved. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, th thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I don't like to uh, tempt fate, but uh, we're getting close. Uh, we're, we're not over the, the complete threshold yet, right? That, I mean, I actually right. um, yeah. uh, defer to uh, Mr. Yes, we're getting Rogers. we're get, getting closer, and um, this is a, a big step in getting us to the final goal. Uh, we were uh, sixteen million dollars short right. where we needed to be. This is an five million more dollars than we anticipated. Still leaves us with eleven million dollars to get closer. That's after you know we needed sixty one million, so now we're down to eleven million short. But we, uh, and we are confident we're gonna make that up in the next month. We have a lot of good leads, but we still have a little bit of work ahead of us. Okay, yeah, I know. It's been a big project and uh, close is only good in the horseshoes, right? So yeah. it's all or nothing. Uh, if uh, <laughs> worst case scenario, if we fall short, let's say we fall short by 3 million, 4 million, uh, with the August 31st, I, I don't, uh, they wouldn't say no, right? I mean. I will defer those questions to council and the CIO. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know how to phrase the question any better. Yeah, and we, in, we intend to close the, the sale of and the purchase of the hospital by the deadline of August 31st. And we're confident we'll be able to do that. And uh, they're okay waiting until October uh, for the state money, right? No, we're, well, we're, we're going to be, uh, yeah. that's what we're doing today. We're going to be taking out this grant anticipation note. So we're going to get, get the money, borrow it, give it to the hospital for the purchase. <clears throat> and then we will get reimbursed by oh, the state I of California sure. whenever yeah. the grant comes in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You could think of this as a bridge funding. We're bridging that gap. Yeah. Time uh, gap. The pay it and get it back. Correct. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Mr. Chair. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, they, I just I want to just really thank our legislative delegation and also our CAO, Carlos Palacios, and our former Health Services Agency Director, Mimi Hall, who have been very active in making this happen. And I should mention some others, I know, but uh, those are two that I can think of right away. I think this is, we just had a full morning of health and human service discussion uh, this morning. This is the most important thing for this county to succeed in of any of those health and human services agencies that we've talked about. The long-term impact of this, of providing um, hospital services to the South County, especially where we have uh, an equity concern uh, as well. Uh, this is the biggest health and human services agency a criteria or uh, accomplishment, excuse me, that we can, we can make. And I wanna thank each and every one of you who've participated in this and made it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll officially maybe open. one, just one more. Sorry, yeah, uh, go ahead. I, uh, with the Power River f uh, flood uh, acquisition, the money we got, I thought that was the biggest project uh, in years uh, for South County. Uh, now, when we have the hospital before us, it's it's as big a project and, and, uh, and the importance to everybody in the county is is equal to that. I mean, we got to keep this hospital open. Otherwise, uh, Dominican would be, uh, you know, overrun, I think. 
And then what about uh, Sutter Hospital? Any indication we might get a million or something from them? So again, I'm going to focus on this bridge funding and I'll You're let right. uh, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Palacios yeah. answer that. We have uh, requests to a number of our healthcare partners um, and we're hopeful that we're going to get more funding from them as well as other uh, state and federal donors as well. So we're, we have a lot of ass out and we're hopeful that we're going to get more help. Good. Okay. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, but we'll celebrate in, August, in uh, uh, September 1st. That's the plan. Hopefully. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. <laughs> There's no other comments or questions from board members. I will officially open the public hearing. Does any member of the public wish to address us on this item? Seeing none here in the chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, then I will close the public hearing and return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput to adopt the recommended actions. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. To clarify, this is for item 10, um, the public hearing for the revenue notes by the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? I just want to say thank you again, uh, Edith and Carlos and everybody. Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Item 10 passes unanimously. Thank you. That uh, resolution being adopted, we'll now proceed to item 11, which is as the board of directors of the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority to also adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of a 22-23 revenue note in an amount not exceeding $30 million, approving a fiscal agent agreement, a local obligation note purchase agreement and placement agent agreement, and authorizing certain other matters relating thereto. And take related actions outlined in the memorandum by the executive director. Yes. Thank you. Um, the presentation for this item is very similar to the first one. So I will just let the recommended actions stand as they are. All right. Any comments or questions from members of the board? Seeing none, uh, is there anyone in the public that wishes to address us on this item? No one here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, I'll return to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput to uh, adopt the recommended actions. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll, Ms. Carroll. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll move on to item 12 to consider adoption of resolution pursuant to government code 7522.56, exempting the hire of an extra help retired annuitant from the 180 day waiting period as interim staffing support for the Pajaro Valley Healthcare District as outlined in the memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. For a report on this item, Assistant CIO Lisa Benson. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. We will make this very quick. This is an item required under CalPERS rules. It has to be on a regular agenda. Uh, a res we're asking you to adopt a resolution that would allow us to hire uh, Beatrice Flores as a senior departmental uh, administrative analyst to join our interim staffing team that is supporting the district and the hospital corporation board in our pursuit of uh, buying the uh, hospital out of bankruptcy and uh, returning it to uh, public ownership. As you just learned by the end of August, it's a very tight deadline. We have a lot of things going on and we felt incredibly fortunate, fortunate to have Ms. Flores available and willing to come provide her expertise in, in supporting these boards and, and helping us along the way. Mm -hmm. So again, typically this is not the kind of thing we would have on a regular agenda, but that is something that is required by Cal. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Any questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? We have no one here in chambers. Is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, I'll return to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Well, I think it was good, Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> second by Supervisor so, Coonerty. Uh, seeing no further uh, discussion, <laughs> roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Benson. We'll proceed with item 13 to consider approval of the Measure D, D five year plan for 2022 23 fiscal year and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CIO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And for a report on this item, we have our Assistant Director of the CDID, uh, Mr. Steve Wiesner. CDI. C CD CDI Department. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Steve Wiesner. Thank you very much. Let's see. I guess I'm on here, yeah? You are on. Okay, all right, great. Um, appreciate being here this afternoon. We'll try to be very brief. Um, hello, Chair Koenig and board members and CAO, members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wiesner. Um, as you said, I'm the Assistant Director of Community Development Infrastructure, the Public Works Division. And here with me today is Casey Carlson. He's our senior civil engineer who's in charge of the county's pavement management program. And Matt Machado, our director, is in the board chambers as well. Uh, Mr. Carlson and I are here today to present your board with a brief Measure D five-year plan update. In our presentation, we'll cover a brief history of Measure D, our past year's projects, this year's project, and then the Measure D five-year plan update that you have before you today. All right, so with that, there's just a few bullet items here. Just to remind everybody that Measure D was a countywide half-cent sales tax measure that was passed by our voters in November 2016. It provides um, some critical funding. Um, it's a 30 year funding source for transportation projects countywide. Um, the county road revenue this year is estimated to be approximately 3.6 million. This is in the next upcoming fiscal year. And uh, per the annual uh, requirements um, of the ordinance that the Regional Transportation Commission has, um, we're required to come back every year to update our five year plan in, in a public hearing. So that's why we're here today. <clears throat> um, after Measure D was passed in 2016, we actually went out and polled uh, many of the communities in the unincorporated areas of our county. And the top priorities we found that our folks wanted um, was maintenance and repair of county roadways, um, specifically in our neighborhoods, and with a focus on safety. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just very quickly, um, so this is the fifth year of implementation for Measure D. Um, it's been a great program for us. Every year um, since 2018, when we started building a bank for these projects, we've been able to put out a pavement management project. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over the first four years. Next slide, please. And I think... Great. So in District 1, um, back in 2018, we did a little bit of work up in the summit area on Miller Hill and Miller Cutoff. 2019, we were able to hit some neighborhoods down in the Live Oak area. 2020, we hit some of the um, some of the roads down in the Thurber area. And in 21, um, we focused in in some of the Soquel neighborhood streets. In District Two, um, we started out in the La Selva area of of that of that district. Um, the next year, on 2019, we moved into the Rio Del Mar area. And in 2020, we were able to hit some roads in the Sea Cliff neighborhood. And then this last year, we did a couple roads down in Coralitos. In District 3, which has um, actually not as many of the roads um, as some of the other districts in our county, um, we, to do a meaningful project, we actually have to bank for a couple years. And so we banked 18 and 19, and we were able to complete um, all the entire length of Martin Road. And um, the last couple of years, we've been banking towards a much larger project out on Swan Road. In District 4, the first year of money, and um, you'll recall Supervisor Kappa, we were able to replace the Casserly Bridge, which was kind of an emergency at that time. Um, and then in 2019 uh, 19 and 20, um, you know, we'd saved up enough money to do the entirety of Lakeview Drive over those two fiscal years. I mean, we are presently banking money towards Paulson Road, which we plan to deliver next year. And in District 5, um, it's been great. We've been able to hit like the downtown core areas of um, the San Lorenzo Valley area. We started off in 2018 in Boulder Creek, moved to Ben Lomond in 2019. And in um, 2020, we were able to hit downtown Felton. And now we're back up in Boulder Creek and starting to work our way out towards the downtown core area. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to have Casey briefly go over the project that we have going on this year. 
Oh, if you click the button, oh, there you go. Here we know. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. So uh, for this year's project in District 1, we've got work on Thurber and Fairway, as well as Portola and 7th. On Portola, we're going to be doing some green bike lane striping in addition to the resurfacing. Next slide, please. Gotcha. District 2, uh, Rio Domar, uh, we're going to do Cliff and Martin, as well as Venetia and Marina, uh, some other streets in the flats there, and as well as some work we're doing in conjunction with Soquel Creek Water District in the uh, Cabrillo College area for some uh, water main work that had been done there. Next slide, please. Uh, District 3, as Steve said, we're still reserving funds for Swanton Road. We're hoping to have a project out there on about 2025. Slide, please. And District 4, we've been reserving funds for Paulson Road. We hope to bring that um, next summer in 2023. And District 5, um, we're working in Ben Lomond now and um, uh, proceeding, proceeding well. Everything's going well in the project so far. And back to Steve. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So, um, and so what you have before you today is the 2022 Measure D five year plan update. Um, with your approval, we'll be forwarding that on to the RTC uh, for their records. Um, the one thing to note in this year's plan is that um, we've recommended a set aside, a $400,000 set aside just right off the top. And that's going to provide some critical match funds for a grant that we won to rebuild the multi-use path along Green Valley Drive down in the southern portion of our county. Um, other than that, the plan looks pretty much the same as it has in the last couple of years. Um, and, and we've been working our way through that initial five-year list, and, and we're doing very well. So with that, um, really appreciate your support on this program. The recommended actions for today are to adopt the attached five, uh, Measure D five-year plan update for this next fiscal year, for the 2023 fiscal year, and authorize Public Works to submit a copy of the approved board package to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. You vote. All right, I think I was under five minutes. Right. And with that, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Assistant Director Wiesner and Mr. Carlson. Are there questions or comments from members of the board? Yes, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, I'd like to take every opportunity I can to look forward to uh, presenting that this is presented to thank the voters for passing Measure D in uh, 2016. Uh, when we became a self-help county, meaning that the state recognized us as a community, a county that said, okay, we want to put something in for our roads. The state said, okay, we'll help you with that and match it. So it, it was a twofer in that respect. And we positioned ourselves to leverage Measure D um, dollars to qualify for millions of dollars from the state and federal transportation grants as well. Um, so it was um, it, it was just a great success story and one that the voters, two thirds of the voters countywide saw, and the fifth and the fifth district, which is mine, uh, I think there are thir uh, thirteen projects this year. Um, uh, uh, for the Measure D funded projects. And when you mentioned the 3.6 million, that was for just the countywide roads, the cities, when it gets to that, it's probably five or 6 million total, isn't it? When they have their road improvements uh, yeah. money too? For That's Measure right. D. Well, so the, there's a bunch of different buckets for the Measure D sales tax measure and the local neighborhood projects are, are about is 30% of the overall annual take of which the county gets about half of that. Yeah, so if we're getting 3.6, then yeah, it's seven, seven and a half to eight million as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations again, and thank you, Mr. Wiesner, you uh, and and the whole Public Works Department. Um, you've been very very responsive to people, and if they want to know what's in it for me, uh, where would they go to see it on the website? Uh, would they? Yeah, so we do. Um, we do have a link to the Measure D five five year update um, on the Public Works website, um, and I think the RTC also has houses that link as well. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other comments or questions from board members? You vote. Supervisor Caput. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for uh, all the work you've been doing. I'll miss you next year <laughs> and I won't be bothering you. So uh, everything looks good. Uh, Paulson Road, is that towards the. Uh, uh, the flooded area. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is from Green Valley. Yeah, down to where Whiting starts. Yeah. Yep. Are we going to be able to do anything to keep it from flooding as bad as it was? Uh, you know, this project doesn't entail any type of drainage work now. You'd have to build a bridge, right? There are some pretty big drainage improvements will yeah. be required. Yeah, it'll make it better. 
uh, at least. And uh, <clears throat> uh, who came up with the great idea uh, uh, with the Casserly Bridge uh, that we replaced over by Smith Road? Yeah, that was actually, uh, it was an internal design, um, our road design section that's headed up by Tim Bailey. They came up with that idea. Yeah, you want to take credit for that? I'm not going to take credit. I'm passing that credit along. <laughs> yeah, we have some good engineers who work for Public Works, and they came up with that idea, and we were able to get it done it in short order. Genius. Yeah. Uh, what it was genius. It was going to cost four times as much as we spent, and we only had so much money. <clears throat> and if we did it, the... Uh, a paperwork way where everything had to be done a certain way, it would have delayed the project probably two years and right. cost four times what we spent. And out of your office, you came up with a plan that uh, satisfied fish and game, satisfied uh, uh, everything. And uh, we were able to get it done in like three months. Yep. Uh, I thought it was remarkable. Thank you. I'll pass that praise away. Yeah. So give my thanks to... Uh, who, who came up with the design? Well, his name is Tim Bailey, and he's our senior design engineer in the road section. He did a great yeah. job. Yeah. The, the other, uh, uh, we're, we're spending some of that money on Paulson Road, uh, but maybe in about two years, we might be able to, how about next year, we'll be able to at least patch potholes on Murphy Road? Well, for sure, our pothole patching program continues annually. Um, but after we build Paulson, we'll start building a bank again for Murphy's Crossing. We know that's the next priority in your district. We think it's about a two, about two to three years to save up enough money okay. to do that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's uh, uh, it'll be a little embarrassing for a year because uh, Monterey is probably going to start uh, next year. We understand their project is going. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, when it gets to the Santa Cruz side, but uh, within a couple of years, uh, we'll catch up. Okay. It was either uh, Paulson or Murphy with some of that money, right? That's right. Okay. And then uh, let's go Murphy and Paulson. You know, that's pretty much it. Uh, I uh, Oh, uh, Houlihan and Highway 152, uh, we're going to start pretty soon. Um, we are actually, that's not funded through Measure D, um, but that project is actually on track to hopefully be put out this fall. Okay, they, they got to start it before the rain season though, right? Um, we'll get into construction and then if, you know, rain delays us, then, you know, then we'll be delayed. Okay. But yeah, our plan is to just go go forward with it. So we're thinking around September, October? Yes, that's right. Okay. Hey, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kappen. <laughs> Well, I, it's hard not to get excited about road projects. It's I mean, you ask the voters, and it's just consistently at the top of uh, things they'd like to see more of. Um, so we're grateful that we do have Measure D. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot of uh, you know un unmet need throughout our road system, but uh, Measure D does allow us to make some essential uh, repairs. I'm, I'm really excited about the repairs we'll be making in the first district. Um, you know, with that limited amount of money, we are focusing on some major collectors and arterials, where I know uh, a lot of people are going to be able to appreciate those improvements. Uh, and I'm also grateful for the fact that we're looking at ways to improve bike and uh, pedestrian infrastructure at the same time as we undertake those projects to really get as much bang for our buck as possible. Supervisor Friend. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, share the appreciation. I, I have uh, just a, a brief question and then a comment. The comment is just as we, if the board ends up moving forward on the, uh, the combined department's uh, analysts that handle communications, I think to the degree that we can improve some of the Measure D and storm related damage, uh, the website and sort of the outreach would be preferred. It, it is sometimes kind of tough, I think, for constituents to really know what's coming up next, what the timelines are of things. Um, I'm intimately familiar with, with the page that you have for SB1 and Measure D, but there still requires some deconstruction. So I think that just to the degree that that, that information is easily accessible, the community would make it better. I did have a follow. Uh, my question just deals with um, once mobilized some of the adjacency advantages for, for roads, is it possible as we go into at least next fiscal and we, we go to bid, when I look at some of these roads, I sometimes see that there are some, this is what happened in Coralitas, as you may recollect last year, we were doing a number of roads. There was kind of a, a stranded small road that ended up being 
about 25 or 30,000 additional dollars in order to to complete. Uh, your team was very generous um, of being able to do it. I mean, it came out of my uh, the second district's allocation for this coming year for Measure D funds. But all the same, there was an adjacency component. Is there a way to just moving forward on these roads to 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 structure an RFP as such to kind of see whether there's whether we can grab an extra road or two in each of these districts or make a determination as a board even regarding general fund allocation for additional backfill on uh, measure D funding. I feel as though sometimes when we have this mobilized, it's actually a pretty de minimis cost for this additional road that may be adjacent, but we're not really given an option because we don't see uh, that as a price point, sort of as a menu price point. Well, that's a good point, and also a great question. Um, we we do look at adjacency adjacency to the to the projects that we have out there. Um, if our if our bids, we've only been using Measure D funds for for this program, so if our bids come in a little lower than what we had anticipated, um, then there might be an opportunity for there for the for us to add a road, um, let's say mid project through a change order or something like that. Um, it's hard for us to know exactly how the bids are going to come in, so we can't. 100% anticipate that, and we don't necessarily want to telegraph that. Um, that said, uh, we're definitely always looking for opportunities to get more done when we're in an area. And so, yeah, to your point, we would always be looking for that. But to the degree, I appreciate, I, I hear what you're saying about how to structure the RFP, and I recognize telegraphing. To the degree, though, that um, that information that that could be found out even ex post facto once mobilized would be useful for the board to then make a determination. This all falls during budget time anyway, um, Director Wiesner. So, I mean, to me, I feel like, meaning that when we make these, the, the projects are done during the summer or, or the budget, the board is making these determinations around the same time, the measure D five-year plan comes at the same time. So that, that would be a time for, for a last day discussion potentially of maybe it's it's not an additional significant amount of money and you get to add a road per district. I, I don't actually know what it would be, but I just want, I'm talking about for, for future boards, especially to be able to have that kind of flexibility for adjacency might make sense is built into your communications program as part of the budget time. We're certainly willing to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. All right, seeing no other comments or questions from board members, I'll open it to the public. Any member of the public wishes to address us on the five-year Measure D plan? Seeing none here in the chamber, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom, Chair. All right, then I'll return to the board for action. I'll move. Uh, so we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson. Is that a second by Supervisor Cabot? All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, we'll now proceed. We are, for those of us joining in the public audience today, we are still on the regular agenda. Uh, and we just have a couple more items and anticipate beginning the uh, or continuing the budget hearing shortly. So we are on item 14 from this morning's regular agenda. And as the board of directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, uh, we'll have a public hearing to consider 22, 23 Freedom County Sanitation District sewer service charge report and adopt resolution confirming the 22, 23 sewer service charge report as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. A report on this item, we have Ashley Trujillo. Hi, good afternoon. On May 10th, 2022, the board approved in concept the fiscal year 2022-23 sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District and said today is the date of the public hearing for the sewer service charge report. The sewer service charges are increasing by an overall amount of 7.4%. The sewer service charge report containing the assessor's parcel number and the amount of the service charges was electronically filed with the clerk of the board for public review. We therefore recommend that the board make the recommended actions read by Ms. Um, Director Koenig, sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Engineer Trujillo. Are there any uh, questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, I will officially open the public hearing. Any member of the public wish to address us on uh, this item? Seeing none here in chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom for this item, Chair. All right, then I'll close the public hearing and return to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. 
motion by Su Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now proceed to item 15, which is as the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District, public hearing to consider 2223 Davenport County Sanitation District water and sewer service charge reports and adopt resolution confirming the 2223 water and service service charge reports as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. Thank you. Ashley Trujillo, sanitation engineer. Again, on May 10th, 2022, the board approved in concept the fiscal year 2022-23 sewer service charges for the Davenport County Sanitation District. And said today is the date of the public hearing on the sewer service charge reports. The water service charges are increasing by an overall amount of 4.9%. The sewer service charges are decreasing by an overall amount of 3.5%. The water and sewer service charge reports containing the assessor's parcel numbers and the amount of the service charges were electrically, electronically filed with the clerk of the board for public review. Therefore, we recommend that the board make the recommended actions um, from Chair Koenig. Thank you, Engineer Trujillo. Any questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, I'll officially open the public hearing. Does any member of the public wish to address us on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers for this item on Zoom, Chair. All right, then I'll return it to the Board for Action. I'll officially close the public hearing and return to the Board for Action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Trujillo. All right, I am now going to adjourn the regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors so that we can resume the budget hearings. This uh, regular meeting is adjourned. Okay.